Katie Jean Mountain. My name is Janet Harris, and I'm the executive director and CEO of the Institute, where we continue Winthrop Rockefeller's collaborative approach to creating transformational change. And what we mean by that is that we here on the mountain are in the business of bringing people together to be thoughtfully concerned and participate in the search for solutions to some of our greatest challenges and opportunities in Arkansas and beyond. And so it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you. Thank you so much for uh, taking time on this beautiful but chilly spring morning to join us here on the mountain. This is going to be a wonderful and robust discussion today. I know there will be a lot of connection and learning and questions, and that is what we are here to do. We are also here today to sort of plant the seeds for a future conversation about water in Arkansas. Fundamentally, our question is, how can we continue to support and nurture and sustain our state's largest industry, agriculture, while continuing to conserve our most precious natural resource, and that is water? And Arkansas, you know, is a very water-rich state, which has, as, as people have reminded me, both its advantages and disadvantages. And so we have to be thinking into the future about how we are going to strike that critical balance. And today's conversation and questions and learning can help us as we bring people together in the future to search for those solutions together. And so I'm very excited about having the opportunity to host the Winthrop Rockefeller Distinguished Lecture Series speaker, Dr. Peter McCormick, who later today is going to deliver a lecture entitled Securing Food and Water in a Changing World. So it's my pleasure to host and welcome all of you. Um, I wanted to give some thanks because uh, we are in the business of collaboration. We know that we don't do anything by ourselves. Um, it takes the support and encouragement of so many people. What you are seeing today in terms of our lecture and programming would not be possible without the support of the Winthrop Rockefeller Distinguished Lecture Series and the University of Arkansas System. Uh, the Lecture Series Advisory Committee is uh, in the business of helping campuses in the U of A system find distinguished lecturers who can deliver uh, thought-provoking content and sort of spur some questions and conversation in Arkansas about issues that are important to us. So I want to thank the Winthrop Rockefeller Distinguished Lecture Series Committee. We have some of those members here in attendance with us today. The Chair, Mr. Bob Brown. We have Mrs. Lisa Ann Rockefeller with us today. Uh, Dr. Jeannie Wayne is here. And finally, uh, Mr. George Dunklin, who is the program chair uh, for the agriculture program on the Distinguished Lecture Series Committee. And George has been a critical and important partner in bringing you this programming, the lecture, and all of the events surrounding it. So thank you, George, for your partnership. And you'll hear from him just a little bit later. I also want to thank the University of Arkansas System, of which the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute is a supporting organization. And we are proud to be a part of the U of A system to work with so many of its campuses on many different issues, um, in, particular, in particular agriculture for this session. And I'd like to acknowledge and recognize Dr. Don Bobbitt, who is here with us, president of the University of Arkansas System. Thank you, Dr. Bobbitt, for being with us. And also, several members of our board are members of the University of Arkansas System leadership. So our chair is Dr. Stephanie Gardner, the provost at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Thank you for being with us. Um, and Dr. D.Q. Fields, uh, who is the Vice President of the University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture. He's going to be moderating the panel in just a few minutes, also a member of our board. Uh, and then, of course, Mrs. Rockefeller is on our board as well. We appreciate you, uh, Lisa Ann, and the support of the Rockefeller family, as always, and all of the work that we do. I'd also like to recognize uh, Bob McEwen, who is a member of our board, and his wife, Mary Ann. They're here with us today. Bob is a great supporter of the work that we do and a longtime uh, connected uh, sort of family member of the, of the Rockefellers, uh, having known and worked with them for many years. Um, we, I also want to point out that a former board member who was here from the very beginning of the start of the Institute and all the work is with us, and that's Mr. Barry McEwen and his wife, Phyllis. So um, please give me, uh, join me in giving them all a round of applause. Thank you. Director at the Institute. 
to. She retired, but I still drag her up here as often as I can. So Marta, uh, thank you for coming back to join us. You're going to have a chance in a little while to meet and hear from Dr. Peter McCormick, who is the executive director of the Darden Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska. Um, and you'll learn about his expertise. I think you'll learn from him. He will certainly learn from you. This is uh, his first visit to Arkansas, and we've had a great time. It has been a personal privilege of mine to get to introduce you to my home state. And uh, we've had some great conversations about, yes, the challenges in Arkansas, but mostly the opportunities that are there. And uh, so it's just been a pleasure to get to know Peter and his wife, Marion, who's going to be joining us later. Thank you for coming uh, all the way from Scotland via Nebraska, um, and we're so glad to have you and have you be part of this. And I know it won't be the last time uh, that we have an opportunity to work with you, so I'm really excited about that. Um, last but not least, I want to thank uh, our team here at the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute. We talk a lot about what makes this place special, and it is our our place, uh, which is rooted in Governor Winthrop Rockefeller's legacy of convening right here on this mountain. He moved here 70 years ago last month, um, and for the 20 years that he lived on this mountain, he brought people to rooms just like this um, and you know, encouraged them to be thoughtfully concerned. So we have that beautiful place. We have the process that we use, which we call the Rockefeller ethic, bringing people together in collaborative problem solving, respectful dialogue, and making sure that we have a diversity of viewpoints in the room so that we can really have robust solutions to our, and, and actions that we can take forward. So those two things are really important, but what makes it all work is the people that we have. And so I would like to recognize our team here at the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute. There's so many of them to name, both from our hospitality, our front desk, folks who are serving food, cleaning the rooms, our programs team who have worked so hard to put this event together, uh, our marketing team that helps us tell the story, and so many others. And I'm going to introduce a couple of them in a moment. But before I do, I did also see someone else I wanted to say hello and thanks to, and that is Colonel Ray Todd, who has joined us from the University of Arkansas Board of Trustees. Thank you, Colonel Todd, for being with us today. Um, I would like to introduce to you James Hopper, who is our Director of Development here at the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute. Uh, James, along with uh, his his partner in crime, Molly Thompson, who is our Education and Evaluation Officer, have been so uh, key and critical in helping us put all of this together. And James has some acknowledgments uh, that he wants to make, and then he'll introduce our panel. So once again, thank you all for coming very much, and I look forward to the discussion.
that they cutting edge research and apply it to their fields and learn things that there's another way for them to do right now. And it's exactly the kind of collaboration that we try to inspire here. But thank you for y'all showing us, um, you know, the boots on the ground look of agriculture. Um, researchers like Chris Henry um, coordinated a wonderful, you know, learning experience for us both at the Rice Extension Center and their neighbors next door at the USDA uh, Dale Bumpers facility. Also, I'd like to thank Alton um, Johnson, who's the director of the Extension Center, is here somewhere, although I don't see him right now. There we go. Um, please say hello to him. He will talk your arm off, won't you? <laughs> Absolutely. But um, he, it's because he has a whole lot to say, and he knows a whole lot more about rice than I'm guessing everybody else in this room. Although, we'll find out when we get one of them. Um, and, of course, uh, George Dunkley, you know, who not only served us as host and welcomed us into his lodge, but taught us about and showed us all the conservation strategies that are being employed. And obviously that's a place that he's cared about for years, but the place, the thing he showed us that really made his eyes light up was when he took us to go meet some of his students. They recently started a program in partnership with UA Monticello, and that's the future of waterfowl conservation. There's some really cool things going on there, and you need to learn a little bit more about that. And I'd like to thank the people that are going to make today possible, too. And that's the first step is the panelists. So I'd like to thank uh, Secretary Westport, Arkansas Secretary for Agriculture, Chris Koeflisher, Director of the Arkansas Department of Ag, the Natural Resources Division, Ed Swain, who got mentioned earlier, but the Executive Director of Bayou Mita Water Management District, and Evan T, uh, Vice President of Environmental Issues at the Arkansas Farm Bureau. And of course, today's panelists are going to be led by uh, and moderated by uh, Dr. D.Q. Fields. Uh, Dr. Fields is the Vice President for Agriculture at the U of A system and has served in that capacity since last July. Um, previously, he was Dean of the Bumpers College at the University of Arkansas and a Professor and Department Chair at Auburn University. His training is in agricultural economics, having earned his bachelor's degree from Southern University of Baton Rouge, master's from the University of Missouri, and a doctorate from LSU. In addition to all of that, the Institute is happy and honored for him to serve as one of our board members. And please welcome everybody up to the stage. Thank
facility that the Game and Fish operates, over 33,000 acres of bottomland hardwoods, and part of our facilities will remove water from that area when nature doesn't carry it off quick enough in the spring to preserve that habitat. Then throughout the rest of the project, we'll have water available if people want to flood fields in the fall if it's not raining soon enough and they want to flood fields for ducks, they will be able to use our water. Then we'll also add some habitat within the system. My background goes back through the Arkansas Soil and Water Conservation Commission, which is a predecessor of the current Natural Resources Division in the State Department of Agriculture. That agency has bonding authority and also water quantity authority and responsibilities and is the non-federal project sponsor for our project as well as the White River project, which is immediately to our east and will pull water out of the White River. So we've worked on these projects for decades, working toward operation and the financing and a lot of the leadership for that came from the state level and still does. And then our district where I work now is the kind of on the ground sponsor of the project. We borrow money from the state, use that to match federal money that comes in through the Natural Resources Conservation Service as well as the Corps of Engineers. And we solve small problems on the ground with landowner issues or land acquisition issues and we try to keep things going. And eventually we'll operate the whole project to deliver the water. Well, thanks, Ed. Uh, I'm Wes Moore from the Arkansas Department of Agriculture and I uh, got appointed to this, this position in, uh, in March of 2015 by Governor Hutchinson and so was uh, fortunate to be able to serve under his administration and thank, very thankful to be reappointed to serve under Governor Sanders. And so uh, if you look at the State Department of Agriculture, we, we serve a broad range uh, of, of interest, uh, more specifically agriculture, natural resources, forestry. Uh, as, as Janet mentioned, agriculture is our, our state's largest industry and there's just a, a thousand things going on every single day to, to make our industry successful and uh, overcoming challenges and helping uh, the producers and the industry move forward. And so just very thankful to be able to be in this position and to serve our state and our, our state's largest industry. And uh, so that's one piece of it on the, on the state side, uh, you know, serving in this position. But uh, I also serve uh, in the Marine Corps. I'm an attachment commander with the Civil Affairs Unit out in California. And so I mentioned that not just, to be just, not just because of the military itself, uh, but because a lot of what we do and a lot of what you, when you think about conflicts throughout the country, as Colonel Todd knows and others, uh, where, where do conflict, conflicts often start? Uh, usually with food. And if you don't have water, you don't have food. So water is so incredibly important. And we talk about water a lot, uh, not just in the, our you know, State Department of Agriculture role, but also through the, through the military role as well. Uh, so it's incredibly important for a broad range of reasons. And I'm excited to get to talk a little bit about some of those things with y'all today. And, uh, the last thing I'll mention uh, is that uh, if you're looking at the panel, I'm, I'm excited to be up here with this team of experts. There's you know, very incredibly smart people here, but if you look at us, you probably notice a few things uh, about us sitting up here. One, uh, that they're all uh, smarter than me, which is uh, doesn't take long to figure that out. You'll, you'll, you'll notice that pretty quick. But two, they're also uh, better dressed. Uh, and I'm thankful to be the only one not wearing a tie, but Mr. George Duckman wasn't wearing a tie, so I don't feel so bad about it. <laughs> My name is Evan Teague. I'm a, a Vice President of Environmental Issues at Arkansas Farm Bureau. I've been here about uh, 18 years now. Uh, the issue that actually brought me to Farm Bureau was a water-related issue. Uh, many of you understand or have heard of the issue in Northwest Arkansas, between Arkansas and Oklahoma. Um, grew up in small towns in Dumas and Walnut Ridge High School around the agriculture <clears throat> my whole life. My family's not a farm family, but all my friends have been my whole life. and. Um, it was interesting I was how I came to Farm Bureau and got involved in these issues specifically. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was home uh, one weekend for Christmas and I, uh, I was visiting one of my, my high school uh, best friend and his family and we were riding around his farm. And uh, at that time he was on the Farm Bureau Board of Directors and he uh, was getting these phone calls, these, these questions. He was on a call with another board member and they kept asking him these questions about Arkansas and Oklahoma and Illinois River. And uh, he kept answering them, and I would shake my head and say, no, that's not right. And I would tell him the answer. And, uh, and he'll remain nameless, so. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, that went on for about five to seven minutes, and uh, I heard the person on the other line say, who in the world do you have in the vehicle with you? And he said, 
well, it's my buddy from college. He's an engineer at Little Rock. He works in you know, environmental issues. And he said, don't you know, we just created a position we're trying to fill uh, for somebody that knows these issues. And he's like, yeah, I didn't think about that. And I'll call him and I'll, I'll visit with him after we get on the phone. See if he'll apply for the job. So that's 18 years and seven months ago. So I was hired as, hired as Farm Bureau's first environmental specialist at the time, uh, transitioning to Director of Environmental Affairs. Um, Covered water issues, worked very closely with the guys here on the panel, uh, state water planning issues, and Bob um, Mead and Green Prairie. I've also been involved in the Illinois watershed issues, things of that nature. Uh, proud to say that I uh, 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 played uh, important roles in the Illinois River Watershed Partnership and the creation of that, and also the Discovery Farms Program. That's, those two things are probably two of the things that I'm most proud of. Uh, my background, I uh, my, got my undergraduate degree in civil engineering, a uh, master's degree in environmental engineering, and uh, I guess one of the things that I'm most proud of now, at the age of 52, I'm in the Walton College of Business uh, Executive MBA program, so that's who I am. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris Kaufleisher. I'm the director of the Natural Resources Division in the Department of Agriculture. And uh, first of all, I've been in that position for about a year and a half and appreciate Secretary Ward giving me a chance to lead that division. Uh, but my background, for the most part, has been more fish and wildlife related. So when I was working on water issues, it was really about the things that are swimming in the stream and waterfowl that need water and food resources. And so now I'd be over in the natural resources side where we're looking at water conservation and water quality and working with a team of partners to try to accomplish you know, a lot of our water goals across the state has been very fulfilling. And in the division, we have a lot of different programs where we're act actively trying to create positive change when it comes to water and wastewater and, and infrastructure in communities and water quality We have programs, for example, where we can do stream bank stabilization projects, and tax credits for water conservation, and so always trying to be innovative and try to come up with new ways to uh, address some of the problems and do that in, in a way that's collaborative and with a lot of different partners. As Evan mentioned, you know, he works with a lot of the folks on this team that's up here today. Much like us, we work with everybody on this, on this panel and then a lot of the faces in the room to try to address the problems that we face because, you know, sometimes we're throwing curveballs and we have to figure out as a state how to adjust to those. And so very rewarding. Uh, we have a lot of positives, but we also have a lot of challenges that we need to work on. Thank you. All right, great. Um, I'll start with a comment that Secretary Ward made where he talked about food security and water, how water is tied to that. And we hear that food security is natural security. So that means that water is very well tied to, nat to our overall national security. So. Um, I'll give you some facts about this, about how important water is to Arkansas. We always hear that water is a, that Arkansas is a water-rich state, but how water-rich is Arkansas? So I'll give some facts and then I'll kind of open up for some questions. So uh, when we think about Arkansas's ranking nationally in terms of irrigated acres, Arkansas ranks third in the nation in terms of irrigated acres, uh, behind, of course, Nebraska uh, with, with about uh, 8.6 million acres, uh, California with about 7.5 in Arkansas with almost 5 million irrigated acres. And when you think of our region, Arkansas really stands out um, with, in terms of irrigated acres, even more than Texas with a lot of acres, but Arkansas has more irrigated acres than Texas actually does, and about 37% of all of our acreage is actually irrigated. So when we talk about how water rich, I think we have to really put it in context to see where how Arkansas stands out. And if you compare the next state in our region um, in terms of the percentage, that would be Mississippi, at about 17% of its acreage that is, is actually irrigated. So definitely a water rich state. So when we think about that, looking at Arkansas and our agricultural resources, being so water rich, what are some of the important issues that uh, we should be thinking about and working on right now to maintain that water rich status? Well, that, that, uh, characterization as water rich is kind of kind of works against us because we have so much water available to us and so much water stored in the ground that it's met our needs up to now and we have used it to produce what we produce but we have short memories when it comes to those times <coughs> when flooding and, and droughts both uh, I think the the memory 
of a flood lasts about six months. So people have a flood and, and they start to adapt to it and then they say, oh, well, that won't happen for a while. And they don't fix things. They don't fix levees. They don't fix other structures they need to fix. And then, then we get in another emergency. Same thing happens with, with water that we use consumptively is that as long as we have a lot of it, we don't worry about it a whole lot. And one of the areas you see this is in in our statutes and in our legal cases, the legislature doesn't work on water issues unless there's an issue, a problem that gets their attention. People don't go to court and work out the legal framework for how you solve disputes until there's a dispute that lasts long enough for them to spend the time and the money on it. So we'll have a drought or a flood period, and then you see an echo in the legislative work in the court cases. So there are a lot of court cases that follow the early 1950s drought. There's also a lot of monumental water law in the state of Arkansas that was developed in the late 50s. Around the, I say the turn of the century, but it's the turn of the 1800s to the 1900s, um, you see our framework for drainage and flood control because we were clearing the the eastern part of the state trying to farm over there we needed to drain it and then we had those periodic floods and that caused people to build out our our water infrastructure in that part of the state so i think that that's number one issue is we have so much water that we don't worry about it enough and we don't prepare for those times when we have too much or too little sometimes we have both in the same year we've had periods when people had water uh, up on the levee but their land was dry as a bone. So we just have to be more forward looking and, and prepare more and not just wait until we have a problem and then react to it. Because that's just not good management of those resources. Yeah, I, I'll be quick in my comments. I agree with everything Ed said. You know, when you think about flood, I, I think immediately, I think of the 2019 flood along the Arkansas River. and. Uh, Literally, just saw AJ Gary yesterday, and we talked about the flood and just making sure we are we are, are we as a state thinking about that, and preparing for that, and, and what it takes to avoid that sort of uh, devastation again. And so, uh, so when you think about water, it's as Ed mentioned, you, you you've got to think about uh, one, you know, making sure that you're prepared for you know, too much water uh, in, in, a, in a given situation, but uh, you know how you how you move water. So it's getting water off the field so you can get back into it. Uh, it's, it's, it's making sure that homes and, you know, and others uh, aren't, aren't impacted by too much. Uh, but I think about last year, you know, some of the southern parts of the state got too much rain uh, and one part that impacted their crops while the other part of the state was burning up and their cattle producers didn't have any hay. So it's uh, uh, different parts of the state, different experiences in different ways. And so irrigation and, and water are, are incredibly important uh, to be thinking about because in, in literally in Arkansas, but across the country, you may have one, one, one spot that has too much and another spot that has not enough. And uh, we see that even on a localized area as well. So there, so even even though we are irrigating a lot in Arkansas, we still, uh, and, and we're doing well on managing water in that capacity, we still, we still have room to go and, and a lot of work that can still be done there to make sure uh, not just our agriculture industry, but homes and others are, are, are protected when we have too much at once. I think to that point, or, or to add to that point, uh, one of the things uh, you have to be concerned about is, is if you're worried about Arkansas losing that status as a water-rich state, uh, if you weren't paying attention to it, you would be at risk of losing that status. And in Arkansas, I believe we probably got one of the most robust water monitoring uh, programs in the country. I think uh, we are paying attention to what's going on, and we do see trends in certain areas uh, that we know need to be addressed. And I think a lot of the research that is done uh, by the university and as well as by our state agencies. Uh, I think a lot of people uh, don't realize how fortunate we are to have a land grant with a very robust cooperative extension service. A lot of states have lost that. Um, and that having an extension service has enabled programs like the Discovery Farms and the Water Monitoring Network. And that allows us to take on projects and look at things a different way that some other states might, might not be able to. Um, I know one of the things that Discovery Farms has looked at is water use efficiencies. And over the last several years in, the, in East Arkansas, probably the last 10 years, 
uh, pipe planner and things and like that have become wide, or more widely adopted, whereas 10 years ago it wasn't that common. Um, one of the Discovery Farms programs, and I think it's the Cotton Farm in Southeast Arkansas, has shown that if you uh, use both the technology as well as the management, you can get water use efficiencies upward, uh, upwards of 90% on some fields. So uh, I think sometimes looking on the outside, uh, a lot of people think that we're not using water efficiently. And we, do, we can do a better job and have more work to do, uh, but we are working on things and are getting some very impressive numbers in certain cases. I'll agree with all the panelists comments and I think you know one of the things that's a challenge because we are water rich it's hard to prepare for a time that you may not be water rich because things change you know weather patterns change and so trying to make investments that are very costly in infrastructure is very difficult when you're getting a lot of rain. I, I, it's sort of akin to trying to invest in a, in a generator thinking about an ice storm that may come you know but when the ice storm comes, you'll pay twice as much for the generator. I mean, you'll go out, you'll try to find one, do anything you can. And so at times it's very difficult. Um, we get a lot of rainfall. I mean, we get over 50 inches of rainfall a year. But it's not always at the right time, and it's very difficult to hold on to that when you really need it. And that costs money to make those investments. I know it'll, it'll tell you how much it costs to try to build a very large irrigation project. And, I mean, that's difficult to do. But it's something that we have to figure out a way to, to be more strategic and do those, do those things. Great. So I, I'll start this question with uh, Secretary Ward. You know, um, being a water-rich state, it's been mentioned that it's a good, it can be a good or a bad thing. Um, so because we have such rich resources, other states are looking at Arkansas as, as a potential opportunity to come for more fruit and vegetable production or things like that. Um, you've heard of the Next California project and you know their interest in looking at the Mississippi uh, River Delta region and uh, bringing in more fruit and vegetable production. So how do we feel about that or how do we think about managing our resources when other folks are looking at us as an opportunity for, for expanding production? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a great question. And uh, uh, interestingly, you know, I mentioned the, the military. My, my reserve unit's actually in California, so I go out there every every other month or so, and uh, it's you know, not uncommon that when I'm out there, we see the sun, conserve water, conserve water, don't use too much water. And so it's been a little bit wet this year, but, uh, but California, no doubt, has a, has a water problem. Uh, and so we're, again, it, it, it reminds me every time I'm out there how blessed we are in Arkansas to have an abundance of water. Uh, but I do think that there are some incredible uh, opportunities there. You know, I think the West in general, not just California, but the other surrounding states have water issues that they're trying to figure out. Uh, too little, too late, I'm afraid. Uh, hopefully they get there because that, that impacts all of us uh, just because there's so much agricultural production that comes from uh, California and those states. But, uh, but I do think it opens up some good opportunities for Arkansas. We, we've seen uh, the specialty crop production increase. We've seen the value of those uh, increase pretty, pretty substantially. And so there's a lot of opportunities uh, for, for Arkansas, which can grow a lot of the same uh, fruits and vegetables uh, that, that California does for Arkansas to pick that up. And, and, uh, and I think even just looking internally, you know, getting a little bit off the water topic, but there's, there's a lot of opportunities there for you know, farm to school programs, local agriculture. There's, there's a lot of things that we can, that Arkansas is uh, fortunate enough with our natural resources and to resources and our ability to grow just about anything, uh, that we can fill that gap pretty easily. So uh, I think there is interest. I think people are looking at that. We've seen several producers who have you know, recognized that and are trying to do more. Uh, but I think the opportunities are, are certainly there for, for our industry. And uh, at the same time, uh, thinking about, uh, as Chris mentioned, you know, being strategic, you know, California and those Western states are, have water problems that I, I know that they wish they had gotten ahead of 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and Arkansas has to do the same. We've got to be thinking 30, 40, 50 years in advance of what are we doing now to make sure that we don't end up in a situation like, like they're deal dealing with. And uh, if that comes, that we're prepared for it. Well, that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to do is to make sure that over time that we can continue to farm in the area of the state that we're responsible for. Evan mentioned the data. We have so much water data in Arkansas. I think it's, we probably have more groundwater data than any other state in the Southeast. 
I know that Mississippi is trying to catch up with Arkansas's information on water use in general through a metering program that they put in place. But we've done water use reporting for years, and it's, it's not always measured, but it is checked against tables, and then we do the best we can, but we get a lot of data in. You can debate the quality of it or, or whether it tells you everything that you need to know, but one person who works for a company that, that does some type of metering said, water uses horseshoes and hand grenades. I mean, and when you're talking about the kind of volume that, that we've got with water, the answer is we're going to use all our groundwater up and not be able to use it in the future. It might be an acre foot here, an acre foot there, but on a gross scale, if we don't have it available, then we're completely dependent on rainfall for the source of water. Then we'll have to conserve what we can to try to get the most out of that, which we should do in any case, no matter how much water we have. But we need also to have that, that storage in the ground. And that's where we're in a really good place. We have the, the terrain to do all types of agriculture in Arkansas. We have abundant rainfall, we have abundant stream flow, and we have groundwater as well. So we're well placed if we manage this and, and go <coughs> forward to uh, sustain agriculture forever. Yeah, and I'll jump in. Um, one of the things that's been encouraging is to look at the, the practices that are going on on farm. I mean, we've got a lot of our producers that are investing you know, their dollars and impoundments and tailwater recoveries and land leveling and different projects trying to conserve water, everything from cover crops. I mean, all of those things are gonna have very positive, beneficial gains in water. And so more incentives for those opportunities and more education about, you know, really the work that Dr. Henry's been doing where they can show actually, you know, really good yields at very low water costs and you know, the more of those things that we can do is really going to help. And so trying to get more folks adopted and doing those practices is going to be important. Yeah, to the point of uh, the California project, more fruit vegetable production uh, moving to Arkansas, I think one of the things that we're seeing within our organization, within Farm Bureau, is uh, we have commodity divisions and uh, our fruit, our, our specialty crops division is probably one of our fastest growing divisions. So there's lots of interest being shown in fruit and vegetable production in Arkansas. I don't know if that's tied you know, to the California project, but um, the interest in, the, in those particular commodities is increasing. And obviously, obviously those producers, those farmers will need access uh, to water, uh, just like uh, our, our cattle, uh, cattle, livestock producers and row crop folks. So that will be an issue that, that uh, we will have to uh, deal with. So Evan, since you have a mic, uh, we, we've been talking about, we mentioned groundwater, and about 80% of, of Arkansas's irrigation demand is, is from groundwater provided by the Lower Mississippi River Basin. So, uh, but we've talked about how important it is to make sure we don't uh, just depend on what we have now. So what do we do to try to expand our, you know, kind of groundwater capture, and what do we have in place there? Well, from a, from a groundwater perspective, and thinking of surface water as well, I believe that the statistic is about 90% of the water that flows through Arkansas doesn't get used, or as fast as through Arkansas, goes to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so we have uh, vast resources in surface water, and uh, the surface water projects, the Grand Prairie and Balameda, uh, obviously are key to offsetting those demands on, on the aquifers. Um, as, as Ed was mentioning, those aquifers can serve as a, as a a storage mechanism at times when you have uh, low surface water uh, availability. Uh, so from that perspective, that's what I would think on that aspect of it. Other from groundwater? I think from a, from a groundwater perspective, um, you know, we are heavily dependent on groundwater. About 71% of our total water use in the state is groundwater. And so we've, we've discussed, you know, alternative sources such as surface water, uh, conservation, obviously, but you know, there's a lot of work going on too about groundwater recharge. And, you know, what are the areas that are allowing, you know, recharge, whether that be wetlands, oxbow lakes, you know, the soil types, the, the geology that it helps recharge our, our groundwater. And I think 
more investigation, more study in that area is something that we need to do, and, and it's important. And there's a lot of work going on right now uh, on that in that particular subject. But I think those you know those three things are probably the more critical things that we need to focus on. And one of the things that we need to remember with groundwater is that we have different aquifers that we use. The alluvial aquifer in East Arkansas is where most of this water comes from. And it's always been historically easy to get that water. It's right below the surface, or was historically. Uh, it gets deeper and deeper every year. But eventually you hit the bottom of that aquifer. And then when you go past it, you go into aquifers like the Sparta aquifer that are deeper and they're confined aquifers, they have finer material in them, and they also don't recharge the same way that the alluvial aquifer recharges. The Sparta recharges where it comes out of the ground and, and water goes into it and makes its way through over a long period of time. If you live east of what we call the fall line in Arkansas where the hills drop off into the flatlands or the rolling hills in south Arkansas, you drink water out of that aquifer. If you live in the city of Memphis, you drink water out of that aquifer. If you live in a big part of Mississippi, you drink water out of that aquifer, as well as Louisiana, and even, I think, up into Illinois, just a little bit. It's a multi-state aquifer of very high-quality water. When you take that water out for consumptive use, for drinking water, you chlorinate it so that it stays uh, safe to drink in the lines. You really don't have to do much other than get the, the dirt out of it if there's any in it. Uh, but we have to conserve that aquifer for industry and for drinking water in our state. And if we use that for our larger water uses like agriculture, which we've seen some, uh, we're, we're eating into another resource that we have an infrastructure built around for drinking water if you had to treat surface water in East Arkansas and build the plants to do that, you'd go through all the state financing and all the federal financing in an instant because you'd have to build all these water treatment plants in East Arkansas. That aquifer was also the subject of a Supreme Court case last year. Mississippi and Tennessee are mad at each other because groundwater doesn't know where the state line is. So Memphis pulls that water out and the people in North Mississippi thought, hey, you've got the Mississippi River right there, you should use that water and not use the aquifer because you're stealing our water right out from under our feet. And these controversies are, are going to get worse and worse, especially with interstate uh, resources like the Sparta Aquifer. So, so I'll point this one to you, Chris. So um, to address all of our big issues in agriculture and with water, Partnerships and collaboration have to be extremely important. So I just want everybody to kind of give some thoughts on important partnerships we have going on in the state, things that where we see collaboration that we know will make a difference down the road. So. Yeah, you bet. Uh, one thing we do well in Arkansas is we know how to partner. And so we work with all kinds of different folks, whether it be industry, nonprofits, um, you know, state and federal agencies. So for example, last year we held the Groundwater Summit where we invited you know, a lot of our, you know, academic folks to come, state and federal agencies to come really talk about a lot of the groundwater projects that are going on across the state, a lot of the monitoring and data collection. Um, and that was very helpful. We'll do another one this summer um, where we're focused on specifically on groundwater. I think about the irrigation projects. Um, you've got, you know, two federal agencies, the Corps of Engineers and Natural Resource Conservation Service state agency, Department of Agriculture, and then you know local boards that are helping out. You've got support from local NGO groups that see the value of, of those irrigation projects. So lots of collaboration going on in this, in this circle of around groundwater and water conservation. I can say the same thing on the water quality side. Um, a lot of different partners coming together really in a way that's collaborative, you know, trying not to be heavy handed in any way but trying to really look and, and gather knowledge and experience from all of those different groups um, to try to address our problems. And so far that has been very good. I think that is what has positioned us to be a little further ahead in some of our other states is because we have that broad support. I'll 
like oh, Chris's comments, and I think Arkansas is probably the envy of a lot of other states. I think when uh, when the federal government started rolling out the MRBI program and RCPP because of Arkansas's strong partnering networks, we received a large majority of, of those fundings, and a lot of that, those funds came to Arkansas for water conservation measures, water quality issues, water quantity issues. I think uh, one of the examples of that is through the Arkansas Discovery Funds program. We have now a, a, a conservation partnership that's, that's uh, with numerous members throughout the conservation community, state, federal agencies, agriculture, as well as nonprofits. I think we also have now a, uh, a, a national monitoring network, and I think Arkansas is one of the, the top members in that as well. So I think uh, from a collaborative effort and a conservation, uh, a, a, a collaboration aspect, Arkansas is probably second to none. Yeah, and I'll just make a couple quick points there. You know, I, I think it's uh, it's the partnerships on the ground uh, locally and throughout the state that, that are so important. And you know, we get to, from a state part of agriculture, get to interact with states across the country. And uh, when, when we tell them stories, uh, they're, they're often just shocked that uh, we can get people in the same rooms together and talk about things and work together on things. And that, as they've said, that, that doesn't happen in other states, which is, uh, unfortunate for them, but uh, I think it just again shows just how great the state of Arkansas is and our ability to, to work together to solve problems and, and to get things done. So on, on that level, certainly there's Arkansas's well advantage there, but uh, even uh, even with our, our governor, uh, you know, Governor Hutchinson was a big supporter of, of, of these, you know, the, the groundwater projects and working together. Uh, governor Sanders is the same way she knows how important these, these projects are. And, uh, and working together, our congressional delegation, our state legislature. So we, we're just fortunate all the way across the board from, from the ground all the way through through our uh, leadership to, to be able to work together in a great state to get things done. And, and uh, we're very thankful for that. Sometimes we take that for granted, but we, we really are unique across the country in that regard. I have a question for the audience on, on that question. Uh, a few years ago, we updated the Arkansas Water Plan. and. Uh, Raise your hand if you came to at least one water plan meeting. I went to about 250. But I, <laughs> so when we had those water plan meetings, I always thought when we got in a room that, wow, we've got everybody here. We really do. Uh, so everybody interested in water issues in, in whatever capacity was able to show up when you've got a population of about three million people, but you're still, you know, a huge water user. You can get those folks who who deal with water to come together and talk, and, and that was a, a good collaborative process that that brought a lot of y'all together. So, um, of course, agriculture is one of the larger users users of water uh, throughout the state, and um, but sometimes because of that. Uh, agriculture gets criticized, you know, publicly for water use. And so one of the things that we always have a difficult time doing is really telling our story well and being able to say why water is important to agriculture and why it's necessary. So when we think about that, um, when we think about the average everyday citizen, sometimes they don't understand us. Uh, I came from a state where, you know, one year after, when they were in, in the middle of a big drought, um, they shut off water to greenhouses that were producing agricultural products. And one day without water in a greenhouse, and you lose your entire crop. And so they, they let um, car washes continue to use water, but they didn't <laughs> let a greenhouse uh, continue to use water in that state. And because they didn't understand, they said it was like water in the lawn. And so how do we tell our story better? What do we want the average Arkansan to understand about you know, water, and how do we tell them our story? I'll tell you just anecdotally that uh, I live in Little Rock, and if somebody asks me what I do for a living and I start to explain, I've realized I've got to start at the beginning. I've got to say, we grow a lot of row crops in Arkansas, and we have to irrigate those crops because they don't even know that part. So when I say irrigation project, it's like, uh-oh, I skipped a step. Uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, everybody's focused on their own, own problems. You know, a pothole that somebody hits in a car, they get mad about it, they want it fixed. So that's their interaction with infrastructure, but they don't know where their water comes from or where their food comes from. 
And I'm, I'm interested to hear in all the different responses to this question because it, it's a it's a challenge, and I'm interested in hearing else thoughts as well. But uh, you know what? It's pretty easy to ask someone, did you have breakfast this morning? Like, did you have, did you have food any time in the last few hours? Uh, that's, that's agriculture. That's, you know, that's the importance of water in, in our agriculture industry. And so it's, uh, it, it's harder, as I mentioned, it's harder and harder to communicate that. People just have, there's just a disconnect. Uh, and I think that's, that's on us. We've got a lot of people trying to help answer that and solve that and, and work to help educate people that are further removed from uh, production, uh, agriculture. but. Uh, uh, you know, I, th I think it starts at an early age. I think it's, uh, you know, y'all went on a tour. I think it's getting getting more people out on, on tours to see firsthand what, what agriculture is and how important it is and what it, what it takes for, uh, for your food to be uh, produced and end up in, uh, on your plate and then just at a grocery store. And so, uh, so it's incredibly important and that's, that's where we need all of y'all's help to be able to communicate that. And uh, if you talk about food, you talk about water and that we're all connected and just helping people understand that is important, but it's a very significant Challenge. I think you're right. I think there's a disconnect. Uh, you know, everybody has their own set of issues they're worried about every day. And in the, in the major metropolitan areas across the country, their their daily concerns are not where does their food come from. Um, from our perspective, and if you look at say drinking water or wastewater or food, uh, how many of you, when you walk in to your bathroom in the morning and turn the faucet on, you wonder where that water came from? Just um, and then you flush the toilet and it goes, you don't have to deal with it. Well, where does your food come from? It's, it's on the shelf. Uh, it's, it's taken for granted. And that's a testament, actually, to agriculture that we've done such a great job of producing food at for the prices that people don't even have to worry about it in the United States. Um, but it's also a challenge for us. I know within our organization and county farm bureau meetings, and, um, we spend a lot of time talking to the choir about these very issues, about People don't understand the issues that we're dealing with, whether it's the actual production or water usage or water quality issues. Um, how how you get people to pay more attention to that? I don't know. I, it, it, you know, when people have to pay have to pay attention to something like that, they will. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do a better job of telling our story and communicating all the efforts that we are <coughs> undertaking to improve you know, yield production and water use efficiencies and things like that. Because we don't tell those stories, or if we aren't working on those issues, then someone will come in and tell us how to do things. So we have to be working on these issues to demonstrate that we are working in, in good faith and, and trying to be a good stewards of our resources. Yeah, what, one thing that I've learned in, in uh, working for the state of Arkansas and working in conservation is that education never stops. I mean, you have to continue to educate folks about, you know, when I tell folks that 71% of our water comes from groundwater, they're like, what? I mean, I, I get it out of the tap. Boy, it's not coming out of the ground. Like, your city is pumping it out of the ground and then pumping it to you. Uh, same thing with, like, our local economies. When, you know, coming to the Natural Resources Division, I was very surprised and very proud that, you know, we're the number one rice producing state and that we're number four in catfish and that we raise, you know, more bait fish and sport fish than most places. And that, that is part of who we are. And so that takes resources, and, but educating folks about local economies and the importance of water and all of the different things that we do in this state, I mean, we are really sort of a self-sufficient state. We can do all the things that we want to do right here if we manage our resources right. And so, you know, that's very important when I think about connections with things like, you know, irrigated crops and waterfowl. You know, we are a very important place for migratory waterfowl and migratory birds. And, you know, how important water is in that particular scenario and the foods that we grow and the crops that we grow. And so all of those things are interconnected. And, you know, there's a lot, you can just keep going down the chain of all the interconnections there. And so we really do need to do a better job and we need the folks that are all connected to it to talk about it too and tell the story. I mean, I work with, you know, water conservation with Ducks Unlimited and, you know, the Nature Conservancy and folks like that that people wouldn't even realize that we're all working together on the same thing. May have different interests, but all still the same thing. So more education. So to continue to get better, technology and innovation is driving agriculture now. So. Um, for the infrastructure needs we have, things like that, what are some interesting things or some tech, new technology and new advancements that happen in the water area that would be good for the audience to know about? 
I'll say Dr. Henry's uh, most crop for drop uh, contest is, is just amazing what people can do. And I think innovation is, that's the thing about people. I and mean, we figure out how to do things. And, and that's going to always apply no matter what else we do with our resources. If we use them all up, we'll figure out something else to do. We don't want to use all, all our resources. We want to find out what we can do to use them better. Yeah, I'm, I completely agree with that. You know, the University of Arkansas has got great folks. Uh, our, our, our universities across the state, I see people from UAPB and from uh, our other institutions, they're, 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 that's so incredibly important. Uh, the research uh, that's driving those new technologies and the new methods of doing things. Uh, you know, I think I think we're doing a good job of, of that, and certainly we're. Uh, I, I know that y'all just recently were up in D.C. just talking about the land grant universities and, uh, and and how important they are and, and how they need to be adequately funded. Uh, and, and it's true, you know, if you're thinking about how you how you find better ways of doing things, you, you've got to have the research and the, the development of technology to be able to do that. And so making sure that those are uh, adequately funded uh, uh, is, is important. From a uh, technology adoption perspective. Uh, before I came to Farmview, I worked in water and wastewater resources engineering. And uh, one of the departments I worked with was our electrical engineers. And they were doing a lot of what they call scale up systems for water and wastewater treatment plants. And essentially what that is, is you can automate uh, artificial intelligence, turning pumps on and off, or monitoring certain levels in reservoirs, or um, soft start and hard stop, motors and things like that. Variable frequency drives where you determine the rate of flow based on the demand. And you can do that all automated. Uh, as I was coming to Farm Bureau, I thought this is a technology at some point we will see in agriculture. And we're starting to see that. Um, I know Chris Henry is, is looking at some of this in his research. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, um, in fields you can install soil moisture probes. And those probes can be tied to a pump with an automatic uh, start on it, and when the soil moisture in, uh, drops to a certain level, you can turn that pump on, and that increases your water use efficiency. Now, technology is not the end all be all. You can't just you know, quote unquote set it and forget it. You still have to manage that technology properly, but it will help um, increase your water use efficiencies. It will can also help save time um, um, for that farmer to focus on other things. Um, but I think. From that perspective, and looking at technology adoption, um, you know, a lot of the issues that we're dealing with today, we tackled most of the easy issues. So now we're we're really fine tuning uh, agricultural production with with things like technology and precision agriculture. So I think from from a technology perspective, um, you'll see those practices continue to be adopted. When you're on the end, everybody steals all the good stuff. <laughs> but I'll just echo that. I think technology is really going to help in a couple areas. I mean, obviously, water conservation, so knowing like how much water to put out, really being very precise with it, I think it's going to help. And then water quality. So, you know, you heard like Memphis being right beside, you know, the Mississippi River. You know, I would love to see advances in, in how we treat water and clean water for, may not be for drinking water use, but maybe for industrial use and some of those things to take advantage of some of the surface water that may be right beside them. You know, how do we do that and do it in a way that's cost effective, that, you know, it's not going to put somebody out of business or, or put us as consumers in a place where we can't afford so since you have the mic, you know, and this time I'll ask you the first part of the question. <laughs> I set myself up. <laughs> so, you know, we've, we've been talking about things happening in, in uh, this water conservation. So are there any projects or proposals out there that haven't been implemented that people may not know about that would be important to mention at this point? Two of the biggest projects, and I, I know we've, we've mentioned these before, and they're actually already being implemented, but they're not pumping water yet. And that's the two irrigation projects, uh, Grand Prairie and Bayou. I mean, those are going to be huge projects. You know, you're talking close to 600,000 acres of irrigated lands uh, once these projects come online. So that's going to be critical. I think learning from these projects, too, to see what you can do on a smaller scale, maybe things that you might do different, uh, things that you know may be faster or, or may not cost as much or some of the things that we can learn. I think additional studies, I know the Corps uh, right now is interested in doing a 729 study on groundwater 
just trying to understand more about recharge and, and potential ways for recharge. So I think those are all good. And then, you know, any technology advancements, um, you know, technology changes so fast. And so there's, there could be things come out next year that we didn't even think about today. Um, and so those are some of the things just right off the top of my head that maybe aren't working at the very, at this very moment, but at some point they will be. I don't know that I can add to that. Any others? Is it? All right, so I, I'm here and I'm, I look at George Duncan, so I know that if I'm up here and I don't say anything about waterfowl and wildlife, then I'm going to be in trouble. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the importance of water and, and what we're doing in the area of wildlife management and waterfowl management in Arkansas because it's a big part of our industry and brings a lot of tourists to the state, so definitely an a income generator. But, you know, just the overall importance of, of water in that overall um, ecology. That relationship is, is vitally important. Uh, I think about you know East Arkansas, uh, a part of the state that's lost population. Um, you know, the connection between water and the crops that are grown there, and migratory waterfowl, uh, not even the waterfowl, migratory birds in general, is very important. Um, I've once worked for the Game and Fish Commission, and you know. Duck season, and this is an old number, but duck season for Stuttgart was a million dollars a day for a 60-day duck season. Um, you know, that's critically important for their tourism. Um, you've got celebrities flying in, you know, landing at the airport. A lot of those are going to places like Five Oaks and, and other industries there. So critically important. Um, you know, migratory waterfowl, as they're going from north to south, they've got to have resources. And, in the, in the wildlife world, we called it duck energy days. And so they have to have enough energy to go south and actually get back north to the breeding grounds and you know bring that next generation along. So vitally important there. Um, and so you know that interconnection, you know, I think about what if we grew things that were not as important from a food resource, you know, because we had to, because of we didn't have adequate water, for example, to grow rice and how that would impact land values, how that would impact tourism, how that would impact actual species that migrate. And so very, very important. Um, those are some of the things that we talk about and that we think about from our side, and just that interconnection and how important it is for local communities, but also even from a global perspective and a national perspective. Just one thought, I can't add a lot to what Chris said, but thinking of, of practices that we're looking at within agriculture and how it might benefit wildlife. I think of cover crops. Um, you know, cover crops are being used for a con as a conservation effort in agriculture to reduce, uh, to increase water infiltration and also reduce <coughs> nutrient runoff. Um, you know, those cover crops could also be planted in mixes that might benefit a waterfowl habitat and things of that nature as well. So. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just make a quick point. Uh, you know, I, I do think uh, Arkansas is just uh, incredibly blessed. I mean, if you the drive up here this morning from Little Rock, you just see how beautiful our state is, and you get up on the mountain, you get the overlook, and it's just, it's incredible. Uh, and so we've got a lot of great things going on for us, and the, the wildlife is so incredibly important. Uh, but there, there's just a, an interconnection amongst all of it with just our, our, our abundant natural resources between whether it's agriculture production or state's largest industry or or wildlife uh, habitat and the outdoor opportunities, the outdoor recreation uh, opportunities. You know, that's a that's a, a big topic for Governor Sanders right now, and it's just a, an incre there's incredible opportunities for our state. We're doing so many things well, and I think there's uh, un untapped potential there. And uh, you know, it's uh, it's really it's really neat just to kind of look and just take a step back where, wherever you're going, where, wherever you are, just think think about what what our state's about and just the, the natural beauty that we have and how interconnected those are. Uh, but, you know, agriculture is our number one industry, tourism is number two, and they all tie together. Uh, you know, and I, I told the governor and I told Secretary Mills this, the new uh, secretary for the Department of Parks and Tourism, that agriculture is still number one and tourism is number two. But then, <laughs> not to forget that. But, uh, it's, uh, but it's important and then they all work together. I can't add to all that. <laughs> Back to the Secretary of War. So one of the <laughs> important things uh, is, is always going to be policy. And so are there any things happening on the policy front related to water that um, that would be good for the audience to know or that you know, may be coming down the road in terms of policy that can impact? 
impact how we do more. You know, I think uh, I think that's a, a, a great question and a timely question. So most, most of you know uh, th this year, 2023, is just a, a, a packed, fun-filled, exciting year for agriculture on the policy front just because, one, uh, on the state level, you know, right now there's a legislative session going on and they'll be here for, uh, we'll see how much longer they're here, but at least for another another few weeks or so. Uh, but there's just a lot of discussions on, on a broad range of policy items, but agriculture comes up frequently, as, as I mentioned earlier. You know, we, we've got a great state legislature. They, they under, understand how important agriculture is and our natural resources are, and so uh, I don't think there's anybody there that wants to do anything to harm that, but it's often, you know, how do we have those discussions to make sure that uh, we're accomplishing what they're what, what they're trying to achieve and help them to do that. So on the state level, the, the legislative session that's going on, but uh, on the federal level, uh, it's farm bill year. And so certainly our congressional delegation is engaged in that. Senator Bozeman uh, being the ranking member of Senate Ag, uh, you know, Congressman Westman on natural resources, you've got Congressman Crawford on House Ag. So we, we, we've got great congressional leadership. Uh, I see key steps here from Senator Cotton's office. You know, we, we, we really do have an incredible congressional delegation that's uh, engaged on the federal level on those policy items, especially it being a farm bill year. But uh, but that's where that's that's where, and, and they'll tell you this to you. I'm just repeating it for them that uh, they they want to hear from you. They want to hear from us on what's important and how do we help it accomplish those things from a policy perspective and uh, a program perspective. And so water certainly very important, a, a big topic that's coming up as both in those discussions too. Any other policy folks? I think we have a pretty solid water policy in Arkansas uh, we have things like the non riparian permit system that were developed in the 80s to be able to use water from one source over a large area at the same time that law if you look at a place like California or out west where they argue about whether they're going to dry a stream up to use water for another purpose for cities or for agriculture. We don't have that issue in Arkansas. One, we have a lot more water. But two, that permitting process takes into account the water that needs to stay in that stream. So we protect that, and then we take a very conservative slice of that and can use it for non riparian water use. Groundwater is a little tougher. We have at least the statements in policy that we don't want to as they say, mine or groundwater, use more than goes back in. But in practice, we, we just develop the habit of using as much water as possible in any particular situation. And I think that's where we're, we're not going to be able to force people to change behavior based on regulation, but we need to have incentives like tax credit programs that we have and methods of conservation <coughs> that save money for the production of material of crops and industrial items so that there's an economic argument for it. So that it's smarter to conserve than it is to waste. And and that's we're nimble enough, I think, to, to handle that in Arkansas. And that's that's encouraging. I'll just echo Ed's comments and add a little bit to them. And Ed, I'm just sitting there thinking about it. The last time we updated the state water plan was twenty thirteen. Going back through and just doing some reading, that's a decade. It just surprises me that 10 years has passed so fast. But you know, as part of that process, we, uh, from, a, from an immediate policy perspective, I don't think there's anything uh, for this legislative session, but uh, to Ed's point, that uh, the surface water is limited to about 25% that we can use for non riparian uses, and that level is set to, to protect those uses within state policy. I think. Uh, Demonstrating the efficacy of Grand Prairie and Balmeda might uh, allow the increase to, to bump that up just a little bit for additional or for future surface water projects. Um, but I don't see that as being anything that's going to uh, in the near future uh, to, to address that. All right, so you might have had a uh, sure. <laughs> well, um, we have had a great conversation so far with everyone up here. And as usual, we gave, we thought way too many questions to ask everyone because that's usually how this works. Um, but we also wanted to give some time for everybody in the audience to ask some questions for the panelists too. Um, and we have a couple of microphones that we'll pass around. We'll ask uh, Dr. Fields to kind of repeat that question, maybe direct it towards one of y'all up here. And um, 
so if anybody does have a question, we've got about 15, 20 minutes or so for questions. We can probably get a few, through a few of those. And we'll start off with uh, right up here. If you would say your name first, and then um, we'll get yeah. the questions going. I'm uh, Dr. Keith Dixon, a, a retired nephrologist. I had lemon dialysis, as I told it to be but I own thousands and thousands of acres here in Arkansas. Uh, and my issue is an issue that none of you really talked about. In 2019, we had a massive flood. Uh, I watch water levels every day. I own a watershed lake. I have two miles of Coos River that runs through one of my farms over in Perry County. My issue is, is nobody's doing anything about the flooding. Uh, the Foosh River right now in Houston sitting at 23 feet, flood is 25 feet, the normal level is 15. I've called the Army Corps of Engineers and discussed it with them. They only care about traffic on the river. That's all they care about. So they can't even open the dams until the flow gets up where it affects traffic on the river. Um, and so like in 2019, the flood in Arkansas, which caused billions of dollars of damage, was because of Oklahoma opened their dams Nobody's watching the dams and nobody's dealing with the dams with flooding. And I, hey, I appreciate you guys about groundwater. I get it. Um, I've got areas of my farms that have droughts. I've got areas that are flooded. Um, but I don't know if you guys can do anything to help us with the flooding issue. The federal government, the, the Army Corps is not dealing with flooding. Just river traffic because there's millions and millions of dollars made every day in river traffic. And uh, so, you know, like right now, they could be lowering that river because it's going to flood in May. Gonna flood. So it needs to be sitting at 15 feet and not 20, 23 feet where it's sitting today. And it's been sitting there for a week now. Um, so um, you guys have some power. I've written my congressmen and senators. I actually wrote the president. I got response back. Didn't get much taken care of. And I called the Army Corps of Engineers and talked to the people in charge there. But they do not deal with flooding. So that, that's an issue. Anyway, I don't know if there's anything you guys can do to deal with that. <laughs> Sorry to throw a bomb on you, but he <laughs> <laughs> got a bomb proof. Of <laughs> so any thoughts on that? So, sir. Yeah, no, I 100% I, I uh, agree with you and, and share your concerns. You know, the 2019 flood, we were we were very much involved in that, and Governor Hutchinson was involved in that, and that uh, was devastating. As, as you mentioned, uh, the economic loss was very substantial and, and, and difficult. Uh, but what we, what we recognized through that was a lot of these levy districts weren't maintaining their levies the way they were supposed to. Uh, and so we, we've, we've tried to try to help address that. So Governor Hutchison uh, very quickly created a, a levy task force. And it wasn't, it wasn't an open-ended task force, as a lot of task forces often are, but it was uh, you know, right at the end of the flood. And so I want to report by the end of the year, he put $10 million towards helping uh, levies you know, uh, help restore themselves and get back up into, into working order. Uh, there was some legislation that passed, uh, I'm just talking about on the state level, uh, legislation that was passed to help uh, help with some reporting requirements. There's still a lot left to be done. I mean, there's still levy districts throughout the throughout the state that are not maintained the way that they should be. And when these sort of events happen, it, we just know it's going to be devastation and loss. And it is, we just know it, and even before it happens, that that's going to uh, occur. Uh, so there's more work to be done there on trying to help these, these levies and levies and districts get back up to standard. I mentioned uh, uh, we, we kind of got a, a working group with the Corps of Engineers, uh, myself, Chris, uh, the Department of Public Safety uh, in Arkansas, the Division of Emergency Management that worked together and, and talked through some of these issues and just more so on just helping to identify levies that are at risk and trying to help them uh, get up to standard. Uh, a lot of them will often say we just don't have the money to do that and so where, where does that funding come from? Uh, but on the Corps specifically, uh, how they manage those water levels. You know, it, it is something we've, we've shared with the congressional delegation as well. It's very, very difficult and very challenging. I wish there was a better answer for that, but uh, but you're 100 percent right. It, it is a it is a big issue, uh, and, and it's, it's scary to think about. If we have another sort of situation like that, whether it's just re release of water from Oklahoma at that level that's coming in Arkansas, we'll have probably similar uh, impact. Uh, or if we have a, a really devastating uh, large amount of rainfall, probably not to that same level of the water that, that passed through in 2019, but very similar. There's going to be loss, and, and, and we, we need to all be thinking about how we better prepare uh, to, to deal with that. And the, the levy districts and helping levies get back to a, a good, uh, their good standard um, uh, ability to withstand those sort of situations is, is part of it. You have a 500-year flood that they're not, uh, 
ready to equip for to begin with, or you know, you're kind of out of luck anyway. But, uh, but there's a lot of work left to be done there, and you're 100% correct. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Yes, my name is Jim Reynolds. I'm from uh, Greenwood, Arkansas. And my question, uh, I, I would suggest that gentleman as well uh, to maybe check out the Core Reform Network. I've done some work with them in the past, and, and that might be helpful uh, for him to get some answers that he's looking for. Uh, my, my question was dealing with uh, talking about California and capture of uh, water or surface. I, I noticed on the news in California, uh, they've been in a drought, of course, and then they get all this deluge of rain. And now they have no way of capturing it, it seems like. And, and so I, my question is, is uh, what is our plan as far as maybe capturing this water that we're getting as flooding and things? How do we capture that and put it into groundwater? Thank you. Well, that's our groundwater recharge is from our, our abundant rainfall and runoff. So that's, that's number one is that we use less groundwater so that we allow those storage batteries to build back up. So that's that's number one is conserve that water. Then on farm there are so many methods of capturing water and reusing it. Mr. Dan Hooks is here and he was talking about last night his reservoir and the ability to use water to capture water before it leaves the farm. So if it comes across the farm it gets used gets used again, gets used again, gets used again. So those conservation tools, structural like uh, like tailwater pits and reservoirs are one way. Then also non riparian use of water so that if it's in a stream and it's abundant enough and you can pull some of that out and then store it in your own farm facilities while it's not raining enough, that's another method. And then just, just general conservation of that water so you get the most use out of it possible as it's present on the surface. So these tools are here. Uh, Extension, NRCS, and others have got programs in place. We have a tax credit program that uh, is not fully taken advantage of in the state to, to capture some of that water and use it on the farm. So the tools are there. It's, um, I go back to my original, original answer, original question. We have so much abundance until you have a little scarcity or a little taste of scarcity, then you get motivated to, to put those into place. We're working on it. Uh, Mike Daniels, University of Arkansas Division of Agriculture. Uh, got a question. Uh, well, first of all, I got a comment. I just wanted to help put perspective uh, how much irrigation water use we use daily. Uh, in eastern Arkansas for all our irrigated crops. If you're familiar with Beaver Lake, and if you look at the volume of water in Beaver Lake at full level, we have about a little less than two weeks supply of irrigation water for the state. So that means every two weeks we'd have to fill Beaver Lake back up to meet our demand. Uh, the second thing is though, I, I think you talk about water use and, and, and we talk about how are we educating the public, we don't have a, it's not for our own worst enemy. I think if we would work together come up with some type of system to look at just the amount of water that we're reusing and recirculating in, in row crop agriculture alone with our tailwater recovery ditches, uh, that sort of thing, we would have a success story of epic proportions to share with the country uh, about how we're recycling water for irrigation. And yet, none of us are collecting any data on that that I know of. It's tough data to collect, but I don't think until we collect that data that I would like to hear your comment, and I have one other question. Okay, one quick thing to say. When we, when we register our water use and report our water use each year, it's from the source. So if it's out of a bio or out of the ground, then it gets reported that way. But if it is recirculated through your system, just like Dr. Daniel said, you don't report that use. So that's a very good point. And, and I'll jump in. Uh, couple things. One, um, you know, we capture, for example, because we have a tax credit program, where impoundments are going in, where flow meters are going in, where land leveling is taking place. So we have some of that data, and we produce that in our annual groundwater report each year. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at your program, for example, Discovery Farms, um, how that can show, like, you know, basically be a blueprint 
and a way to educate and show demonstration um, where if there are really good practices going on that are saving the water, for example, and they're using tailwater recovery as a technology to conserve water, then you know, really looking like at your program, for example, and just using that as a as a way to promote those practices. Um, and you do a great job with that program, by the way. So Mike is vice president of the Division of Ag. I think you just laid out the abstract for your next big grant project. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it. I'm not, I don't, I'm not afraid to write and beg for money. Uh, that's for sure. And, and that kind of leads me to my next point. We've talked a lot about what the current status quo is and what's happened in the past. But I really think if we're going to address this water issue, we got to think about what's going on in the future. And I think one place we're going to be short is workforce. Uh, if we're going to solve all these problems, we've got to have a, a new, different type of workforce. And one of the problems that we have is that we often, uh, in agriculture, we're having a hard time uh, getting the students that we've historically had in agricultural programs. They don't feel a connection to the farm. We don't have as many kids raising the farm. Dr. Uh, Fields has done a great job improving our enrollment. But I think for a lot of kids, and I would throw myself in this, I was not a farm kid, although I came from, uh, uh, my family were all farmers, but I didn't grow up on farm. But uh, I think there's a, a soil and water conservation could be a gateway to bringing in uh, very good minds and smart students to uh, help, help us address these issues in the future. And one of the things that we were approached by the Dean of uh, University of Arkansas Pine Bluff, Bruce McGowan, uh, was to try to partner with them to establish what we're, and we just got word that we got a little bit of funding through a, a 1890s capacity building grant established the first Discovery Farm Educational Center on a college campus. They have a 50-acre farm, it's centrally located. But Dr. Tamika White, their scholarship coordinator in agriculture, has $2 million in scholarship money that she can't give away because people don't see that they have a career in agriculture. And so if we can use soil and water conservation as a gateway to careers in agriculture. Uh, but I, I bring this up uh, not because I'm really, a, I, I was joking about begging for money, but it's going to take some money to establish this center. And I bring it up because the Discovery Farms has always been very collaborative. And so if there's any of y'all that want to work with us on developing that center where students get hands-on on how to measure conservation, how to measure the impacts, uh, how to address the issues, and most importantly, how to make farmers a part of the solution. I think when we, sometimes we forget that uh, these are the people that manage our lands. And uh, what I've found is if, if I will work with them and provide them data, but if I'll get out of their way, they come up with much better solutions. And we have to recognize that, that our farmers are some of the best observers and scientists. Uh, they just didn't choose to go in that profession. And we, we have to involve them in the solution uh, process. But I want to get your idea, if you, you know, if you're interested or, or do you think this workforce development idea is a good idea? I'll jump in just to say <laughs> So, so uh, you know, you mentioned something that, that's vitally important. I'm throwing on my, my bumper and dean hat here, but you know, I, uh, environmental sciences is really one of the faster growing majors in, in the College of Ag on campus. But I, I always say that education is exposure. And so at this point, we have to figure out how to expose people to what you can do with those degrees as early as possible. And right now we, we're, wait until students are in 10th grade and they've already made their mind up about what they want to do and they don't understand agriculture as a viable option. They don't understand the impact of what happens with our environment and how that's important. It's often that they get to the campus and they are in another major and we're found later. And they take that one course that exposes them to what we, are, what we do. And we have a lot of students transferred into the College of Ag that way. But we, we still have to figure out how to, how to reach down and, and deal with you know the youth and expose them to what agriculture is really all about. Mike, to your point, or, or to address your question a little bit, and we talked earlier about uh, the more technology, agriculture becoming more and more technologically advanced. Uh, today's farmer is not your grandfather's farmer. Uh, I mean, they're astute businessmen, they have to be very technically savvy, they have to understand economics and and all the sciences. Uh, so from that perspective, agriculture uh, is becoming, like society, more and more complicated. Um, in one of my other roles, I serve on the Arkansas 
the ASU College of Engineering and Computer Science Alumni Academy. And one of the things that we're looking at in Arkansas right now is, is we're about 300 engineering and technology graduates short every year that meet the state's need for engineers and technology type majors. And I think you're right, I think engaging that area and, and bringing those folks along and bringing them into uh, not just technology but also agriculture is something that we need to look at. Hi, I'm Alan Shively. I'm the Assistant Dean for Career Services at Arkansas Tech University. So I did not plan this, but thank you, Mike, for uh, interjecting in there also. A lot of the times those conversations come back to my office, where I have the privilege of working with our faculty and our career counselors and our academic advisors at Arkansas Tech. I also want to give a quick moment to you gentlemen. I appreciate that you also added the global lens. I lived abroad for the past better half of a decade. Um, so the conversations I heard working in Dubai, also in London, are the exact same conversations that we're having here today. So I appreciate you adding that global lens. So my question does add into a little bit of what Mike and yourselves were talking about with the workforce. I think our faculty, our academic advisors, and our career counselors do a good job to talk about what the industry needs now. But the conversations you've had about the challenges and opportunities that you're highlighting on the horizon that are coming into 10, 15, 20 years, what are some of those careers and those positions you are looking for and saying, oh, we need this not only now, but it's gonna be dramatic in the next 20 years? So I was wondering if you could give me you know, a high uh, insight there as a career service of what are you looking for so I can work with our students and say, this is gonna make you employable now, but it's gonna put you into management and leadership in the next 15 to 20 years. I'd say three big areas that, that you need to understand and one is how you finance them. So you have to have a, a broad understanding of, of how credit works on, on a large scale public public financing as well as tax policy. And then O and M maintenance of things. We we're building things, we build things every day and, and we forget to set aside money to pay to fix it, to mow it, to, to paint it. So to understand that that long term asset management that, that takes somebody who can, can really understand that and see forward. Don't just build it, but think about how it's going to be maintained. Uh, the watershed dams, uh, I mentioned a few minutes ago, is watershed districts around the state have dams that were built over 50 years ago, but they were designed to last 50 years. So somebody has to know how to pay to reconstruct those and also has to be on top of, of the day-to-day -day work with those. The other is just to bring all the technology together to understand the information. We uh, thankfully recruited a young board member recently, and he came in to meet uh, in our office the other day. He didn't bring a scrap of paper with him. He doesn't touch paper. I had maps and I had lists and things. He took pictures on his phone with it. Um, same person, he'll pull up, he can probably pull up all kinds of GPS stuff off of his farm equipment see exactly what's going on in any minute, see what his wells are doing, how much fertilizer he's applied, what his yields are. So to understand that technology and have the imagination to apply things across different disciplines is, uh, that's gonna be essential in the future. I'll add just a couple things. One, um, you know, I look at like interest in like natural resources careers and and education and natural resources. And if you think about your know, population shift in the state of Arkansas, where you see population decline in East Arkansas and in South Arkansas, where they're exposed to agriculture, or they may be exposed to the outdoors or forestry. And then you've got folks living in urban environments that may not ever think about going into those degree fields. You know, you're seeing that play out some already in foresters and wildlife biologists and some of those natural resources fields, where if you're not exposed to it, you're probably not gonna go in that direction. And if you're losing population in some of those areas where that occurs, then over time, you're just gonna have less people interested in it. You're gonna be trying to recruit people from urban environments. And so probably, you know, from a university standpoint, spending some time on it, trying to attract some of those folks out of urban environments or programs to get them exposed to it, I think would be important. But a lot of the natural resources sciences are seeing declines in students um, and folks interested in that field. For more, I've got one last.
last question. From Wood, Nate Todd, Rear Soldier. Thank you for bringing those threats of water and food to the discussion. Over the last 25 years in our national threat documents, water and food has been one of those items. We in Arkansas are agricultural exports. How is water and the global system going to affect Arkansas agriculture? <coughs> any idea and any of the other families? Yeah, no, I, I think those, uh, appreciate you mentioning that, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's not just uh, from a national security perspective, it's not just us saying it, it goes all the way up to uh, to the president, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I mean, it, water and food is on their mind, which is, which is good. Uh, you know, we're we're glad that they're thinking about those things and thinking about the importance of agriculture and natural resources. But, uh, but you're absolutely right. You know, whether it's you know whether you know, you're dealing with a Middle Eastern country who who may have water scarcity, and I'm just trying to trying to take maybe some of the lessons that we know in Arkansas and in the United States and help share that with them on how to. How to you know, implement you know, best management practices, or uh, or how to move water to, so that they can grow their own food and not have to deal with insecurity and those sort of situations in that way. But uh, you know, and complex broader than just food and food and water shortages. There are other reasons why they're a conflict. But but this is also a uh, you know, water and, and food and natural resources are, are certainly a, a multiplier of that. If you take you inject a little bit of you know, radicalism or whatever it may be. Plus, you know, food or water scarcity. Now you now you've got a problem, a big problem, really quick. Uh, so it's it's you know, we do a lot of things great uh, in the United States and in Arkansas, and being able to share those with with others who might be prone to some sort of instability. But but also it's 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 also uh, you know our agricultural production. We we do export a lot, and so our, our ability to produce is is important not just for us, but it's it's important for those countries that can't. Uh, so making sure that those resources are available to them, you know, if they're not there yet, on being able to grow their own food and have a stable environment that we're helping to support them in that way, not only not only good for them, but it's good for us, and good for our farmers, and good for our markets. And so uh, it's a uh, very important on, on a broad range of uh, topics. But it's uh, it, you know, it makes me happy that from from a food and agriculture and natural resources standpoint, it, it isn't just us in this room talking about it. The highest levels of, of government are talking about the importance of that and what it means across the globe as well. All right. Well, we all, all join me in thanking our panelists as well as our moderator. We are going to take a quick 20 ish minute break to give everyone a chance to stretch your legs, grab a snack, grab a drink. And if everyone can be back in here promptly by 11, that's when we will start our keynote. So with that, I dismiss you into the snack breaks in the hallway.
Just from the last session and a chance to network with your friends. Um, if you didn't get to talk to everybody, uh, please stay for lunch after this. Um, but the uh, next is the main event. And what I'd like to do is invite uh, George Dunklin up in just one minute to uh, introduce our speaker. And um, before that, I thought I'd introduce George a little bit for those of you who don't already know him. Uh, George Dunklin uh, grew up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. What I'd like to do is ask anybody else in here from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Show of hands. Okay. Um, my next question is, how many of y'all have ever gone hunting with a family member for anything? Raise your hands. Sometimes going on a hunt changes the trajectory of a life. And I think that may have been what happened to George. Uh, he began hunting at eight years old with his dad out there in Pine Bluff and shot the gun for the first time when he was about 10 years old and focuses a lot of his time on waterfowl hunting. And what that ignited for George was really a lifelong passion for in pursuit of conservation and set him down the path that he's still on today. Um, he took a couple of detours though. He uh, decided to play tennis for a few years and went to the University of Memphis on a tennis scholarship <laughs> and graduated from there and decided to come back to, to Stuttgart, but also brought his tennis rackets and his wife with him for that and who he met in Memphis. Um, after graduation, they uh, farmed the land that his grandfather owned, and he's never left. He still is there in Stuttgart. He served as a member of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission and president of Ducks Unlimited from 2013 to 2015. He was named the Budweiser Conservationist of the Year in 2009, and recently started a graduate certificate program in partnership with UA Monticello that, like George, is very committed to hands-on discovery learning and to the future of wetlands and waterfowl conservation. He's a wonderful host, friend to many of you here, neighbor for some of you that are here too. And I really do find it kind of difficult to sum up everything that he does, but I thought I'd do this. And I'd say that George is dedicated to making sure that Stuttgart was, is, and will be the duck and rice capital of the world. Mr. George Thank you, I, I, would, I would expand that, not Stuttgart, we're going to make Arkansas the <laughs> you know, rice capital of the world, which it is. And, and uh, I, I just cannot thank enough for the appreciate Ben and your team, Ben and everybody that put this on. Um, at the Distinguished Lecture Series, which uh, I'm chairman of the Chairman Bob Brown, your name is Bob Brown. As we started more than a few years ago, uh, they didn't have an ag person before. Wilson Walker, Governor Walker, that was the one that this was, was his vision for any way to endow this, this lecture series with several millions of dollars. And we're going to have the build season for two or three times a year to be able to work and have these lectures and have these rolling caliber type of people come in and give them their, the different four year universities that we had. But, I actually didn't have a four-year university by uh, me, so I recruited, I recruited the uh, institute here to help me, and uh, this has been beyond uh, my expectations of what we're seeing. The panel discussion today was outstanding. We heard so much about the, uh, the needs and the concerns that we all have for, for Arkansas. We had a wonderful fireside chat last night. Um, the combinations everything. Thank you again to your teams. Let's give them a little bit. So, uh, as James said, uh, this is why we came to hear Dr. Peter McCormick. Dr. McCormick is uh, Executive Director of the Daughtery Water and Food and Local Initiative. Um, he's, he came here a couple of days ago and had a chance to, to drive around Arkansas. He's been in Arkansas for two years, generally. And so I had a chance, I had a chance to spend a couple of days. And uh, he and his wife married. You know, this, this man is extremely passionate about what the Golden Lake Power Year is today, and that's why. He's uh, extremely talented. He's from Scotland originally. He got over, he got his, uh, came to the United States, to Colorado State, got his uh, <coughs> master's in his doctorate there as well. We had to figure out, I guess you got your master's at Big Castle. So, uh, not Okay, Nationals, but you were at Newcastle in 1977. I have to be playing. That's a, 
upper Great Britain, up in England, and I happened to be there at the same time. I didn't run into talking before then, but, but that was, I was playing a tennis tournament back then. The only time I've ever been there. But, but he's, uh, has extremely concerned about not just the United States, but the whole, has a perspective of the global water, water issues and, and surrounding the, the problems of food safety and all those things that we've been talking about today. So he brings a perspective to all of us um, that, that we maybe don't get every day get a chance to hear. Now, we gave him a perspective of Arkansas. This is his first time to, to come to Arkansas. And of course, we had this incredible panel made up of all these folks that uh, are very smart and know what to say. So you, you're going to leave here a little smarter than you came as well. And like we all Absolutely. That, and that is the point that Mr. Rockefeller set up to have right have a, uh, a discussion where we can learn from each other in a very collegial manner, which is kind of unusual in this day and time, it seems like, in the politics of the world that we live in. But I love, I love what Mr. Rockefeller, Governor Rockefeller, set out. His grandson, Bill, is here today. It's what an honor to have the family here with us today. And the legacy that your grandfather left for you, for all of us, all of our kids, we were just lucky that that gentleman moved to Arkansas man. But 70 years ago, uh, last month, and this is where he lived. So to be right here on top of this mountain, you just feel going to Rockefeller's presence in this room today. So without further ado, I've, I've got a long introduction here, but I, you know what? I'm just going to bring the star to show what we're Can you please give a good Arkansas, a great warm Arkansas reception for Dr. Peter? Before Thank you, George. Thank you, Janet. Uh, what a warm welcome. <laughs> um, and thank you to the, to the team here at, at the Institute, to the many people we met over the last two or three days. It was quite a, a fire hose of experience trying to really take in the situation here in Arkansas. And I, I probably, I visited many situations in, to do with water and food, but I probably haven't had such an efficient uh, experience in terms of really trying to understand what the challenges and opportunities were here in Arkansas. But that said, I'm not, uh, one thing I will lay out very early on, one of the things from I've gained over the, my, my career is in, in this space, it's a very complicated space we work in between this large sector agriculture and water, and then you put it into the local context, being prescriptive with solutions or advice is a dangerous space to go into, and, and it's certainly something where more, what are the things we need to be thinking about? Where are the opportunities? How can we address them? And how are we addressing them elsewhere? Uh, and, and what would that do for, for uh, Arkansas or even down at specific levels in Arkansas? But ultimately, it's up to the communities in those landscapes to sort those issues out and, and prepare ahead. I was really fascinated by the panel. And, and it was one of my concerns that they were going before me and, and laying out the challenges and opportunities. And then I had to step up with my prepared presentation around this. I actually think they've, they've hit on a lot of the things I would like to convey. And then the questioners brought out two or three things I, 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 I will also endorse. I really particularly liked, and I, I, I won't try to, uh, who, who to attribute this to, but this long-term uh, uh, view of this. It is really is a journey in, in terms of agriculture, food production, and, and, and water. Um, and, and this 40 or 50 years, it is a long-term, uh, uh, it's a long-term game that we're, we're working on. Planning, one of the, the sort of euphemisms in the water world is to plan for a good drought or a good flood, but basically that was coming out very strong this morning is be prepared. Uh, really be prepared for for some of these coming ahead and think ahead as to what this is going to mean because we talk a lot about climate change and changing conditions, but we can forward cast and really look at some of these challenges and, and be ready for it. And I think Arkansas is actually very well resourced to do that. Um, and then what was coming out also is water is very political. It, it is ultimately that part of the preparation is when the political moments come. And, and if the political will has been built, you're, you're ready for that preparation. And then I think we then emphasize some of the infrastructure pieces, but it, it really also comes down to the people. The institutions need to be prepared. And, and so it's, it's always thinking about how can we strengthen the institutions. And, and I would like to 
bring some of that into it, and, and, and the leadership. But then ultimately, one of the things that was really brought out well by my colleagues from the universities this morning was youth and preparing that next generation, because that really is an issue in terms of the, 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 op the opportunities I had coming to the US and being involved in the investments that were being made at that time in people really held me in very good stead, but not here, just in the United States. I will bring up Indonesia here in, in a few minutes. And one of the key reasons that I'm engaged in Indonesia now is because one of my fellow graduate students was, was uh, he's now the Minister of Public Works in Indonesia. This is the biggest ministry in Indonesia, and he's very closely connected to the president. I was in there last month, and I met with the president of Indonesia because of that connection. And this is a, a, a backstory to that, but I think a key point there was this is a soft power. So we talked about what is uh, global security, but the people and training the people and developing that next generation, that soft power piece of the United States, we, we, we need to rethink that in some of these, these opportunities because these are certainly people that very much appreciate uh, 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 what the US has done for them. And my daughter just came back from Peace Corps two years ago and you go around the world and the impact of Peace Corps, which is getting out of the water and food space, but the impact of Peace Corps has, has been uh, 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 very, very significant to, to the soft power of the United States. With that, I will then uh, go begin to talk about, uh, get into some of the more details. So let's go up to, uh, we have a colleague here from the university asking about being global, so and that's a very, thank you very much for teeing that up. Uh, I think we all noticed in November, uh, the world population crossed into 8 billion people. Uh, the, was it 8 billion then? How do we count that? But basically, we've reached 8 billion people. Um, and we're expected to eat, eat, uh, reach 10 billion people by 2050. And, and then the expectation is we'll level off and, and begin to decline. And we're already declining in certain parts of the world. But, but certainly, that's what we're ex anticipating. But then in Sub-Saharan Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to go from 1 billion now to 2 billion by 2050. This is a population that's younger and will be a very young population in 2050. That's a, an advantage to the continent, but this is a continent that's ex experienced underinvestment, or underinvestment, but particularly in water and food. And, and so the, the issue of them, the continent being able to produce enough food to feed themselves, is, is be, going to become more challenging as we go forward. Uh, this number, I'll show a short video in a little bit, this one billion people food insecure. It's actually, the video is two or three years old, and in that two or three years with COVID, and now the Ukraine crisis war, we've now seen this number reverse. We were actually driving that number down. We're down below 700 million. Again, that's an estimate. There's, uh, the indicator is, is uh, uh, looking at various uh, variables, but the point here is there are more insecure people in the world. And this is actually, it's causing a lot of issues. Uh, when I was at the, the World Food Prize this year, one of the things that came out that was that we're having to now divert development assistance to food aid much more than we ever have. And this is taking us away from the development assistance piece and how we can invest in helping countries to feed themselves. So this, is, this has implications within what we can actually do in, in helping to feed the world. We'll hear a lot about drivers of change uh, and, and, and shocks, the climate change, the things that are changing, the temperature. We, we heard about this nighttime temperature, how it affects the yield of rice as it goes up. The same is happening in corn, how we breed the crops to uh, deal with that. But also, the increased temperature means the evapotranspiration goes up from crops. Perhaps not so significant here in, in Arkansas, but in the drier parts of the United States, this means that we're using more water to produce the same crops, and this actually affects some of our treaties across boundaries and, and, and uh, uh, with, with, with other states. Oh, sorry. Um, and then trades and markets have already talked about conflict, and then degradation of resources. So what we've done is, as we've built out to the 8 billion people, we've built used the best dam sites. Some of those dams are filling up with, with sediment. Some of these rivers are running dry for one reason or another. We've also seen the degradation of water quality. And that degradation of water quality means we're painting ourselves into a corner as to where we produce our food at, at, with, with water and food, because 
we can't, there's certain resources we can't use in the world because we, in, in getting to 8 billion, we, we've, we've uh, uh, impacted the environment. This is, there's many maps like this. I put this up here just to give a sense of water stress. Where are the, wor the parts of the world that are water stressed? The Middle East, um, uh, extending into India. India uh, has done well actually with its agriculture and water, but it has hit, it's over pumped its groundwater in certain areas. In, in, very small farmers, very different from Ukraine, uh, from <laughs> Arkansas, but uh, uh, the, they are, the, the, these many small farmers have been able to, they're the second big, biggest producers of milk in the world, major producers in rice, major producers mm -hmm. in wheat sugar, and, and they feed a, a large part of their own population and are major exporters, but they've done that at an expense of, of some of the important aquifers in, in, the, in the country. And then if you look at Africa, Africa looks like it's not water stressed. Well, part of the reason there is they really haven't developed the infrastructure. They haven't got the capacity to, to manage the water and, and, and apply that. They also don't have, the farmers have expanded extensively. So rather than intensifying production, Africa tends to have expanded its production. So it has fed the, the continent by, by expanding into the ecosystems, the, the forests and so forth. So the, the, that's one continent that where there are opportunities to intensify. So that's a global understanding. Every country's in a, a different space. Maybe one thing I should talk about there is we, we, uh, I'll talk a little bit about where my wife and I have, have traveled and lived. But one of the countries where we worked in was Jordan. And, and that's in the Middle East, water scarce country, but it's also not an especially wealthy country. It's not like Dubai where you can desalinate your way out of, of, of your water problems. It doesn't ha it's an energy insecure country as well. And there, you've seen over the last 20 years, we were there 20 years ago, in the last 20 years, it was already considered water, very water scarce. Uh, really, n agriculture was becoming nearly unsustainable. Uh, it, it's now gone to the point where agriculture, any agriculture that's viable is actually using treated wastewater only. There's very little rain-fed or, or fresh water available for agriculture in Jordan anymore. And then you look at how much water is available to the population. When we lived there, our apartment got water once a week for six hours. You basically had to capture it in a system, and that was you for your, your showers, your washing machines, and you learned to really uh, um, uh, save water in those conditions. I was back there last year. They're down to some communities in Jordan, and these are not poor communities. These are even the middle-class communities are getting water every three weeks. So it's, it's, it's a real, uh, because the population has grown so significantly with the refugees, the water resources are limited, some changes in the hydrology, and it's certainly a, a challenge. So what I, I'm putting this up here is to really kind of, I, as I was preparing for this presentation, I thought, uh, you know, there's all the, in the news about California, what has happened. So this is six months ago and, and now. This is the drought monitor. This is a really fantastic tool that's put across, uh, together with partners across the US that tells you where the droughts are and where things are, are happening. And California now is, is, is looks in good shape. Well, uh, the, the groundwater hasn't recovered. So in California, they do have an issue with groundwater. They've overpumped it. It's also damaged the aquifers. So to get the groundwater back will be impossible in some areas but it's, it still will take time to recharge. And this doesn't really account for the large dams on the Colorado River. This, this hasn't been enough, all the rainfall and so forth, hasn't really addressed the issues that are in the Colorado River. What really surprised me here is actually Nebraska's got worse since September. I hadn't really realized, because we're in the winter, you don't hear much about this at the moment, but actually Nebraska's got drier, so there's, we're looking towards a, a difficult spring unless we get some more precipitation here in the near future. Uh, and, uh, and then I, I looked at Arkansas, I, I, I saw, was looking where Arkansas fits on this, and this is very consistent with what I've been hearing, it's been relatively wet, it's, uh, and certainly it's gone from no, not much drought to zero drought over the last six months, so things are, are good in that, from that perspective. Again, I'm going to qualify this a little bit. When I first landed in Indonesia at the ripe old age of 23, I just was a couple of years out of my first degree, and as I landed, they took my passport and they stamped into the passport 
expert. <laughs> and I've never recovered from that moment. <laughs> Because as you get into this space and you learn more about it, you tend to shut your mouth <laughs> because it's very, it's very complicated. So that's why I've, to my colleagues that have been preparing me for this, this is why I get a little nervous talking to people about a subject in their, in their backyard because it is really something that there are a lot of complexities. You have to listen carefully and, and, and think about the principles that we need to apply in a given uh, uh, situation. So as George said, I'm from Scotland. Uh, I grew up in southwest Scotland. I'll actually put a little map up in the next slide to show you where this is. This is actually right adjacent to the farm I grew up on. This, you would call this a lake, maybe a bayou, uh, but it's, it's a lake. Or, but in Scotland, there's no lakes. This is a loch. And, and, and so this is on the neighbor's farm. And the bright green hill in the middle ground, that's on, on my family farm in, in Scotland. My brother now owns that and, and runs out with his family. And in the, the distance, that's the southern uplands, not the highlands. It's the southern uplands in southwest Scotland. They, they don't have the same Hollywood glitz about the, the southern uplands, but the history there is just as significant. But we, ca we quite like it being a relatively quiet, peaceful part of, of Scotland. My three brothers all live within two miles of this, uh, this farm. They are in, the, they're in the, the three farmhouses that were in our family uh, over 120 years ago. So they, and my mother was born three miles from this farm where my father was born. So it's, it's a very small community. So just so I can, George, I put this on here. I'd actually had this map up before. Southwest Scotland, down in the bottom left, there's a little red circle. That's where the farm is in, on, on the Bladnock River. So that's the most southern distillery in Scotland, if, you, if you're interested. I went to university in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, and I, actually, I point out that I actually went north to England to go to university from Scotland. If you go west from that circle, this is, I just added this a few minutes ago as I realized. As you go west from that circle, there's a small harbor town there. It's called Port Patrick. And it's called Port Patrick because that's where St. Patrick went from Scotland <laughs> to Ireland. And that's, uh, it's also where half of my ancestors crossed into Scotland from Ireland in the 1840s, 1850s. So this is our journey. I don't, where my wife Miriam and I, I say our journey, this is, I couldn't have done this. This has certainly been a joint journey, and certainly uh, uh, we have learned both from each other going around and trying to understand how the, the, the world works. But uh, through Scotland, England, and I, I'll, I'll talk about Indonesia in a bit because I think this is one of the good fortunes we've had in being able to go back to places we've lived and worked is you, you can then check off what has actually happened along that timeline of the 40, 50 years that we've just been talking about. That's an advantage of being older. I can think along a timeline of 40, 50 years. We then went, met in Colorado. We went to Canada for a, a little while, but then realized we weren't that fond of the cold. And, and then uh, we then went to Indonesia, uh, back into a, a remoter part of Indonesia. Then moved to Eritrea. So I'm now challenging geography here. This is Northeast Africa north of Ethiopia on the Red Sea coast. It was a country that had just come, it just had been created. So we went in there, came from Asia, where we were looking at the soft, the soft part of issues we were trying to address. Eritrea was infrastructure short, needed infrastructure, and that was a big part of what we ended up getting pulled into. Back to Colorado, then Jordan, I've already mentioned Jordan, then Washington DC, where I worked inside USAID for four years, which was a fascinating experience, really getting to know how Washington works, or at least how the sausage is made. Uh, then we, we went back to, we actually joined the International Agricultural Research Centers, the International Water Management Institute, which is headquartered in Sri Lanka. And I'll, I'll come back to them, because that's an important piece of history. We moved to India, then Sri Lanka. We were based in Sri Lanka, then North Carolina for a while, for three years, back to academic life, and then spent five more years in Sri Lanka as the, the Deputy director, director General for Research, working in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, and then coming up for seven years ago, we moved back to Nebraska, or back into the Platte River Basin, because that downstream from Fort Collins. I didn't, I didn't want to get into too much detail there because that would fill far more time than, than we have available. But 
I did want to talk about Indonesia, and, and this is just this is really where my career began in, in terms of the international piece. Um, and I was there at, in the early 80s, uh, and, and I went actually, I, I was trained as an agricultural engineer. My interests were in water and in international work at water and agriculture from my farming background. But actually, when I first got sent overseas, I got sent to set up monitoring systems in large rice syst storage systems. Um, and, and this was a, Indonesia in the, in, in the mid-60s was basically a famine country, political upheaval, there had been lots of challenges in the country. And it, I, my, my older colleagues that I met in Indonesia, they talked about the times where there was no food in the markets in the 60s. And this is in the richer part of the, the archipelago. So it was a country that was in really deep problems with its agriculture and, and, and agricult agriculture at that time. But it really, it, it has had a very complex political journey as a country, it's, but it's had a relatively upward trajectory as its economy has developed. And, and it, it really embraced the green revolution with new seeds, new varieties, but also built more infrastructure, managed water. And, and when I went, we were starting to look at how can they manage that more intensively to make it work better. So it really was beginning to think about not so much the infrastructure, but the agronomy, the people management, the institutions, and so forth. It became self-sufficient in rice in 1984. So it's one year after I was there, the country became self-sufficient. So I, I had a big outcome, right? <laughs> my, my, my contribution was tiny. Uh, it, it was storing the rice was an important piece of how you could actually improve food security. It seems to make sense in an agricultural community, but we tend to forget that one way of saving water is to actually store your food so you don't need to have water in the drier years. Uh, the population and economy has grown. It's just fascinating to be able to go back there. We were back there and lived there in the early 90s, but also, I go, as I said, I was back there last month, go back and see how things have changed. And it continues to grow, but that food security thing, the, 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 the rice production, which is important, is just an indicator of what's going on in the food market. But in the late 90s, they really had a problem with the financial crisis, and their rice production fell off. And so they are net importers, but there's opportunities and like everybody, they're re-looking at the post-Ukraine or the Ukraine situation and thinking we need to intensify again and really look at this. And they have the capacity, they have the people who can take on those sort of challenges. So as I said, I was back in Indonesia. I'm, I'm uh, on the board of governors of the World Water Council. And one of the, the World Water Council, basically, its reason for existence is setting up the World Water Forum every three years, a big water conference that tends to look upon agriculture as the orphan child. So I've made it my mission to get more agriculture into the World Water Council, in, into the World Water Forum. And this is where my friend, the minister, comes in, and, and he's helpful because he understands where I'm coming from on this, and we are trying to get more people engaged in, in, in communicating agriculture and water to all our water colleagues. This is actually in the middle of the island of Bali. I've, I've been there a number of times, but this was too, this is unique because these are the, Subak systems in Bali. It's a, a Hindu culture, and through the priests and the temples, more than a thousand years ago, they set up a water management system for managing rice through a proportional allocation of water. But it's a community managed system that, that allocates water to the farmers down through these paddy field, terrace paddy cascading system, but they allocate the water to, to, the, uh, to the communities. This is, is, is a, an old, institution that's worked really well. If you try to go in there and improve it, you, you really are doing a lot of damage. And that's what's happened in many parts of the world. We try to improve it. But it's more difficult to build institutions than build infrastructure. So the people and the institutions are really important in this, in this setting. Their biggest threat at the moment, when I asked the farmers there, the biggest threat is actually the tourism <laughs> that this is now precipitating. Because this is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of the cultural significance of it. And now you've got all these tourists coming in, which changing the whole dynamics of the local villages. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a rather ironic situation. But the point here is it's, it's uh, food production, sustained for over a 1,000 years, and a sustainable water management system. So now, I want to, you will, if you'll indulge me, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute. They, they, one of the reasons I was attracted to this was it has a global perspective. The other was it was set up to have impact. And, and that really also appealed to me because I've always seen research and impact and, 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 and 
to, have, to create a change on the ground is, is what I feel that our, my work is, is best focused on. So the, this was a, the vision of food and water secure world, a very expansive vision, but also on impact. Before I go any further, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Nebraska. And I, I thought I wouldn't really get called out on that, but then I find out that uh, the, a, a retired Department of Natural Resources director is, is in the room, but whom I've, I've actually never met, but I've actually heard her name many times in Nebraska. So Anne Bleed is, is sitting back there. So right beside you, Ed. <laughs> so Anne, Anne's name is, is synonymous with some of the things I'm going to talk about, the, the developments in Nebraska. And she's someone that, that has contributed a lot to, to, to this. So I certainly going, I, I, the history before seven years ago is, is I will defer to Anne on this. <laughs> so let me see if I can play this. I can't see the, the button. One more click and let's it should. In a village in Rwanda, irrigation technology is helping smallholder farmers grow more crops throughout the year, providing food for their families and extra income when they sell the harvest to market. The Doherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska is researching different irrigation business models in Rwanda so the most successful ones can be scaled up, benefiting other smallholder farms throughout the world. This is just one example of how the Institute is making good on its mission to ensure water and food security for our growing world. Since 2010, research by our directors, faculty fellows, students, and partners has resulted in innovative new technology that is having a global impact. This app helps farmers know when to plant and what types of crops to plant based on historical weather, soil, and harvest data, increasing yields while reducing water use. And with that, we have more information to know exactly how much water uh, the plant needs. The Institute uses satellites to detect and predict drought by measuring plant evapotranspiration and soil moisture in arid regions of the world. Farmers and water managers can now use this data to make informed decisions and enhance drought resilience. The Nebraska Water Sciences Lab can detect even the most minute traces of contaminants to improve our water quality and environment. The new model developed by the Institute accurately measures the amount of water it takes to grow crops and livestock so farmers and ranchers can understand how to better manage water and achieve maximum results. Smart water meters track how much electricity is used in pumping water for irrigation, motivating conservative water use. The work of the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute is not just about research and technology, but improving policies as well. Water markets and trading can help alleviate water disparities between farms, natural resources districts, and other governance systems help balance urban and rural water demands. And incentive pricing systems can help water users better manage this precious and limited resource. I love agriculture. I like agriculture. I'm proud to be a farmer. There is a market, there is a need. So we create a company to serve this market, to attract young people, to show us that it's possible to do that. Our knowledge sharing and research development are creating sustainable practices that are vital to our future. In the process, the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute is developing the next generation of researchers and leaders in water and food security. Seven hundred ninety-five million people on our planet do not have access to enough nutritious food. Rising demand for water-intensive foods is increasing pressure on water resources. Climate change is causing extreme weather episodes like floods, droughts, and severe storms that can wipe out crops and livestock. Water and soil contamination is increasing, along with the competition between urban and rural water demands. With a challenge on this scale, tangible outcomes in improving water and food security take years to achieve. 
But the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute has made and continues to make big impacts today. And the future holds even greater promise. Research and innovative development will be accelerated. Successful ideas will be scaled and transferred. Our water and food security impacts will reach more people and improve the quality of life for millions. The science that you do here and the fact you have irrigation and very technical evaporation modeling with the policy, with the economics, and that's what I have to do in my job, is I have to bridge that and you do it so well and you have latest ideas and I come here and I'm always inspired. So I apologize for that being a little marketing oriented, but uh, <laughs> Uh, an important point here is, is partners. Really working with partners is absolutely key in the university. So you had to mention faculty fellows. We work with 130 faculty fellows from all kinds of different disciplines in different ways. And then with the farmers in the natural resource districts in Nebraska, but then with different universities here in the United States and different uh, organizations, where the private sector included, and, and then uh, in, in these countries, during COVID, one of the, where we had established partnerships in the ground, on the ground in like Brazil, Rwanda, and, and, and India, to some extent, it was, it's more challenging with India, but there is where we, were managed to, we managed to keep the momentum going. But without those partners on the ground, it's really difficult to, 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 to implement this. And honestly, to be credible, to have impact, you have to be engaged over a long time. It takes years to really implement some of these things. And, and this I, I, is an image, I just wanted to move out, now to move on to Nebraska and, and talk a little bit, the, the Platte River, Fort Collins is marked on there, that's where Miriam and I met, uh, Denver. And then the, the dark blue is the, is the Platte River, so that flows into the Missouri, it connects to the Missouri just downstream of Omaha, and of course comes down into the Mississippi. Um, and the North Platte, the South Platte. Um, I just <coughs> I noticed the bright green in the urban areas, and this is Denver. And, and I've been watching Denver grow, that Denver metropolitan area grow over the years and, and what, how that's affecting the front range of Colorado and, and the use of uh, water there and the demands for water in the urban areas and, and the, the competition with agriculture. And, and uh, one of my questions always in Nebraska was, what are you, you know, are you paying attention to this uh, in, in terms of what was happening in Colorado? And, and there are robust treaties and, and robust agreements on these issues, but it's come to light that they're perhaps not as robust as we thought they were, and they certainly need to be, we, you need to watch what, uh, uh, studying those, because what has been happening in Denver is it's been growing, they've connected more urban areas to the water supply, they've been taking water from agriculture, they were buying up lands in the early 80s during the, the agricultural crisis, but basically taking water from agriculture, but that has an impact on the river. And it also, they've been, is, are they taking more than they really have, are entitled to? And, and that's, you know, that re requires close attention. Th there's another old adage in the Western US where they talk about water flows towards money. And, and in, in Denver, the greater metro area in Denver now, if you want to build a new house, your tap, just the connection, not the water, the connection, is $50,000. Agriculture can't compete. It's, it, it, uh, even the best agriculture can't compete with that. So it requires the agreements and the, the treaties to be in place to make sure that what, what happens with those, that water. So it's, it's a complicated business, but in a water scarce environment, this is really uh, your, the attention that really needs to be paid in, 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 in those circumstances. In, in, in Nebraska, Nebraska is actually very relatively water. Maybe it doesn't have as much water as Arkansas. But there are some important factors about Nebraska. Nebraska's actually got the most, the, the greatest length of rivers in the, United, in the state in the United States. Um, but more importantly, so we've got the Platte River, but then we've got the Ogallala Aquifer. And, and a point I want to make here, the Ogallala Aquifer outside of Nebraska, it's the poster child for disaster in managing groundwater. Well, they're flat wrong when it comes to Nebraska, but for good reasons. Nebraska, has about, it depends on the numbers you look, but it has most of the groundwater in the Oglala Aquifer sits under Nebraska. 
and it doesn't flow laterally, it doesn't flow into other states, so it's really in Nebraska. And not only that, in the top northwest corner of Nebraska, this territory here, this picture of, of Cherry County in Nebraska is in the sand hills, or on the edge of the sand hills. Those sand hills are, are sand dunes covered in grass, and, and the precipitation that lands there in, in the form of rain or snow basically ends up underground because it's, it's such a permeable environment. So Nebraska has this fabulous managed aquifer recharge given by Mother Nature to, to basically recharge the groundwater. And, and, and this is even the models from climate change suggest this will still function the way it functions now in, in terms of capturing the water. It then flows down south and eastwards and so the Platte River becomes the area where that Platte River Basin becomes the area where all the irrigations developed across the states to 8.5 million hectares that uh, was mentioned in the earlier, in the earlier, uh, not million acres, sorry, was the uh, number mentioned earlier. So there's a lot of water. Um, there's there's the, the river as well. It's, it's the surface water is challenging because of the, the upstream states and the downstream states. I won't even get into the Republican River. That's the contentious one in Nebraska, that part of the world. Uh, but then what happened is groundwater, as the technology became available, as we started using better pumps, and, and center, pivots were, center pivots were invented just over the line in, in, the, in Colorado, but they were commercialized in Nebraska. So center pivots are, are very much a Nebraska technology. It's the four biggest center pivot companies are based in, in, in Nebraska. So irrigation expanded pretty quickly. By the 1970s, this big peak in the number of wells going in, in, in Nebraska. And then the, the state realized there was issues, the farmers realized there was issues, and, and so it was then how to manage that expansion of irrigation, because it was beginning to see, we're beginning to see drops in the, in the, in the, uh, the irrigated area, or, or, or in the groundwater. I just wanted, I put this in last night after talking to George, because th th this is our, these are our ducks. The, <laughs> this is a, the, the flyway through Nebraska. This is in the middle of the Platte River. And, and this a very important uh, roosting site for, the, for the, uh, the sandhill cranes and the few hooping cranes that, that stop in, in Nebraska heading to Canada, um, or coming the other way. Um, and, and that, the, the, even there with that Platte River, part of the use of that river and overusing that river meant the ecosystem in that central part of Nebraska was, be, was being threatened. And so there's been a, a, a large effort, the Platte River Reco Resource Recovery Program, to recover that habitat. And that's managing the water that it, so it will come through there at the right time, creating habitat in the form of sandbars and other things to, to allow the, the the cranes, but also other uh, parts of the ecosystem to function as they would naturally. It's a challenge because this means getting water back. Part of the issue was we didn't realize that groundwater and surface water were connected. And when the groundwater and the surface water were connected, we were actually, there was, the, the controls over the groundwater meant that a lot of water was coming out of the river that the state didn't realize. And, and then having to reverse that, and that took agreements with the states, it involved the federal government, and it really involved buying water back from landowners, which has been a, a very expensive undertaking to, to implement that. The kind of big message there is, it's better to avoid that than to, to try to step back from it. Unfortunately, in many parts of the world, they don't have the, the, the they haven't then developed the economic clout to then try and reverse some of these things. So it, yeah, if you destroy your, or, or damage your environment, coming back is, 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 is even more difficult. That's the, this, is, this photograph is by one of our professors, Mike Fosberg, and, and it's a this time lapse uh, project. There's a really cool tool that's been developed by Mike that, that basically has cameras all the way up the Platte River to, from the, the mountains down to the Missouri and takes pictures through the year. And it's been running for years now, so there's millions of photographs, but it, it lets you really look at what is happening at certain parts of the river system. So let me talk a little bit about the governance and management. And this is where Anne may, uh, uh, this is, a, I might uh, 
step on toes here with Anne, but I, what I want to do is, and this is an important thing that was made by uh, one, the, the, I think Mike earlier about telling the story uh, about what is actually going on and where the successes are. Water, especially water and agriculture, when you step away from it, when you're not close to what is going on, is a very easy target for throwing rocks at. And, 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 and this story with the Ogallala Aquifer. So it's important to tell the story and explain what is going on uh, uh, to, to people. And, and get we, we've had the World Bank out here looking at, at uh, Nebraska. We've, we've talked through this with many different people. But this governance system that was set up in Nebraska, and, and the conservation districts here are somewhat similar. This actually incorporated the equivalent of the conservation districts. And, and it was really a local governance program that multiple counties in a natural resource district, but they, they're, they're roughly following hydrologic boundaries so that they're dealing with the, the water system specifically and, and trying to manage that, that water in, in that space, including the groundwater. It, it, local governance and building trust, so it's, it's a devolved uh, uh, government, government system. That land tenure and water rights is something I put in here, especially where, where, where I'm working in the developing world, because quite often the, the land tenure and the water, the water rights piece of it hasn't been, hasn't been established. Um, but then the ability and willingness to set and enforce rules. So that devolving of the, the responsibilities, it's an elected board. All of the members are elected in the, in, by the local people in that NRD. So it means that you're being, you're being overseen, you're working with your peers. And, and this is where the enforcement piece is something where the NRDs are very reluctant to enforce. It's, it's the kind of last resort, but when it happens, it means when that enforcement happens, it tends to stick because the community has basically bought into this, this issue that someone is playing way outside the rules mm -hmm. And, and, and this has got to stop uh, in, in that particular situation. The way the NRDs are structured, it, it ends up with a portfolio of approaches. So we're, at the moment, we're looking at how they actually do marketing of water within each NRD. And they're all quite different how they've come up with systems to do that, to help farmers who need more water in a drought situation and can buy it from someone else just for that year. But basically, that, that it, it's fascinating to see those different approaches. And then budget. So budget, there's a, they have a tax, they get a tax from the local population into the NRD. So this is not, doesn't come cheap, uh, but it's a, again, the, the communities uh, are, are aware of this and it, it's part of the, the responsibility or, or the, the recognizing the stewardship of, of the, uh, the, uh, the, the water resources. The need for data, and this is always, there's always need for more data. Um, and this is a challenge in, in many areas, but it's a, an area where that's been very instrumental in, in, in managing the water resources and enough state oversight. So it, there are times, and with groundwater in this case, the state sets about targets about where the water table should be and can step in uh, uh, if, if those tables start dropping again. And that's particularly challenging in the pink. If you see the pink areas, that's the, the driest part of the state. It's also where the most irrigation is developed, and it's t where the overpumping still is, is an issue, uh, a, a significant issue. But there, there's a moratorium on new wells. You can't drill new wells. There are some exceptions, but you're not supposed to drill new wells. But at the same time, they're restricted in how much water they can put on every year. I think for each NRD, it's 12 inches per year in a very dry area. So it's not a lot of water. So they, they, have to be, they then have to pick the crops or how they want to grow that, maybe not grow as many acres and, and, make, and compress it or, or grow a different crop than, than, than corn. Certainly don't get much corn grown out in this part of the state. Um, and it's for five years. So it's 12 inches for five years. So if you, like now, if there's a drought this last year, they were probably pumping more than 12 inches, but they've basically drawn on the account for the years ahead that they're going to have to give that back or the plan ahead and keep some in reserve so they can use that in, in years, years forward. Again, here, this, this example here, this was part, included in a study by the, we, with the Env Environmental Defense Fund, and some of this was, was used to, to inform the issues in, in California. California will never knowingly take up a recommendation from Nebraska. I mean, that's just, <laughs> that's the way the world works. 
But if you look carefully at the language in, in, in the legislation in California, you can see the DNA of, of, of what was done here. So there are, there are it's, it's, fortunately, I don't have to prove that one. I just have to uh, uh, include it. The other piece here I wanted to mention, we talk about efficiency. It, this gets contentious in, 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 in uh, water scarce areas because efficiency at the farm level can often mean an inefficiency at the uh, the, the sub-basin level, and at the basin level it can mean an inefficiency because what happens is that water recycles in the basin level. And so your loss from one farm goes downstream and someone's already using it. This happens in a lot of large systems in the world, including the Nile. So people end up double counting the water that's available in the basin. So you have to look at how much water is being consumed through the, the plant. This is where water productivity comes in. And this is basically looking at uh, crop per drop. So it's really looking at how much water passes through the crop. And we were that, so we were taking out all the delivery losses, and that's still something we need to manage, but also looking at how can we maximize that crop per drop in the crops we're, we're growing. And, and this was uh, a study we finished in 2019, and the, these are applying these ideas to, to, the, to Nebraska. What we found is and I wasn't expecting this, but you see this strong upward trend in water productivity. You actually see more yield per drop of water steadily going up over 30 years. This applies to corn, it applies to soybeans. And then that translates into your livestock production. You're actually needing less water to produce the feed to, to produce your, your, your livestock. So that's an important indicator. You can't really translate the numbers directly, but the point here was to look at what what was causing this? Well, it was crop breeding. It was agronomic practices. It was then the livestock management system and the livestock genetics were all very important in, in producing more with less water. So especially in a dry area, this, this is, again, reinforces it's managing the water, the center pivots, we're managing it carefully, but that's the enabling condition to make sure you can actually produce more crop per drop from, from these crops. But it's all not rosy in Nebraska. <laughs> we, we do have some challenges, and, and it is a journey. It, it's something, water resources and managing this, particularly for agriculture, because of the changing requirements and the way things evolve, it's something we've got to pay attention to. That's why the people and the institutions are so important. Water quality is a persistent challenge, and this is something I was listening for when I was down in Stuttgart, and it's you clearly not the same issues here because I think partly because the way rice, it, rice is produced and, and, and the, the fertilizers and pesticides and so forth, but also that the, because rice is produced with this impermeable layer below the, the root zone or below the, the crop, it's not going down below. So you see in Nebraska, in terms of our water quantity, it's been a blessing. In terms of water quality, when we put too much fertilizer on, it goes down. And, and this is something that Again, you learn about what is going on. The problem is a lot of this is now in the Vedo zone. So even as we improve the water, the fertilizer management at the farm level, this nitrate is still in that interface between the root zone and the groundwater level. So this is going to take two or three decades to really address. And this is a very contentious and challenging issue. It's also mixed up with the livestock water quality issues, not to the extent that I think Arkansas is faced with this, although we've now got a lot of chickens moving into the state, so uh, we, we certainly, this will be something that will, again, change the, the, the situation we have to address. But nitrates and the other contaminants in the drinking water are complicated. It's, it's uh, especially for the small communities and the individual farms, because that's where uh, the, 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 the paying attention to what's actually in the drinking water isn't, isn't sort of built into the the systems there, so the, but then even some of the larger communities, the cost of taking the nitrates out where there is an, an issue where the plume has got to, to, to those uh, their well fields, if they can't move their wells or they can't deal with that, treating that is not cheap. And so it becomes very challenging for smaller communities who don't have the capacity to do that. So it's certainly an issue that, that we are, they are working on. I, I put one example up here of one of the areas we're working on with a, a number of partners in the state, but I think one better example might be we have one, a, a set of projects that have been ongoing now for about five or six years called Know Your Well. And this is basically where it's high school kids and picking schools, uh, uh, working with schools um, 
to sample the wells anonymously, not but, so it's not targeting parts, but basically s selecting wells in their community, splitting the sample, sending one to our lab at, at the university, and then they we'd give them a kit to test the, for, for the key constituents in, in the water. And then they upload that onto an, a website, and that's put onto an app so they can read the results when, when they've done the work. That's been a very popular program that's now got more funding again, and we're expanding out. We're pretty much not at every high school by any means, but we, we've got programs across the state, really getting the community, the, the students, and we try to encourage those students to really think about a, a degree in science. So they get a small scholarship if they then go on to a degree in science in, in, in the, at the university. The, the, the other important piece of that is to get the, the, this generation aware of the challenges and issues that, that, that are in their communities and, 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 and to uh, develop an understanding of, of, of an, an understanding of this but also people because in the end it's the local population that have to try and manage these, these issues. I had a whole list of questions and I put them on a slide and I had a great intention last night to kind of melt this down but I have I've talked to people on this, the road trip was fabulous, and then last night I was able to chase down some, like the Illinois River, I, I needed some clarification on that, and, and, and these large projects, the, 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 the two large irrigation projects, I've been aware of those from, from looking at the, the, the sort of federal programs for, for, for over a decade, particularly in 2008, 2009, when these sort of projects became of, of greater interest as, as more funding became available. Um, I, again, the water quality issues are quite different from, from Nebraska. Uh, your water treaty issues with, with the, the boundaries are less significant, perhaps, but again, it needs to be paying attention to. I know the Arkansas River between Kansas and, and Colorado has been a challenge for, for quite a while, and, and, and that's uh, kept those two states busy. Um, and then funding, yeah, this is uh, funding of the infrastructure. But then what I took away from the field visits was some of the options that we have that, that, that are here. The on-farm water management piece of this, the groundwater with the capturing the surface water at the farm or, or, or local levels. The, this is really, uh, to, be, to be able to have multiple sources is, is fabulous water security. <laughs> uh, it, it really is, is important. Um, the planning for the droughts, and then I put it at the bottom, but I meant it to be at the top. The increased awareness, increased engagement and awareness is, is important. One good thing about Nebraska, and I think it's true here as well, most people in the state are one degree separated from a farm. And so they really get agriculture. Maybe not all quite get it the same way, but they, all, they get agriculture. And interestingly, Nebraskans get water. And, and that's an important piece that I think has helped with the the leadership and the emphasis in the 70s around addressing these issues on the water quantity side. And certainly the debate on water quality is getting more people interested in, in, in what is going on. These are, these are, I just stepped back and was thinking, again, coming back to the principles. What do we need to be doing? There's many principles to consider, but certainly this, I was casting back but looking ahead at, in, in terms of where we're going in the 40, 50 years ahead. And, and, and that's, uh, I think that's something that uh, is, is very important because it does, it's amazing. And I, again, I don't want to appear that I'm older than I actually am, but it's really amazing that, that um, how quickly time goes. When I go back to Indonesia and I see Jakarta three times the size it was when I started there, it's sinking because the groundwater has been over pumped. It has expanded into the rice bowl where they were producing three crops per year before the city expanded into it. And, and they, they are now looking at, they're moving their capital to another island. It's the same minister that's helping with this World Water Forum that's doing that. He's the public works minister. So they, they, have, they have challenges, but they are working through these, and some of them are very ambitious. But the, the, the point is, it's in a very short space of time, groundwater over abstraction, flooding, flooding, and sea level rise have really created a problem for, for that part of Indonesia. Uh, a kind of key point, one of, the, one of the reasons I was excited about coming here is the message is, is we need to be sustainable and resilient at a global level. We need more Nebraskans, not in people, but we need more examples like that. And, the, and Arkansas is clearly the, in, in the same boat. How do we, we've got the opportunity to manage water and food 
sustainably and, 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 and have all the pieces and done a lot of the, the work. I think it's this, I, I certainly, the robust institutions, and I, I, I've been talking to many of the institutions here and, and certainly that, that, that here, but it is paying attention to what some of the other issues elsewhere have been and, and what lessons that teaches us here. And this trust and collaboration, it seems that's very much a, an ethic within the, within the state. Um, the capacity and leadership in water and agriculture and food, again, the students, but also encouraging the, the, middle gener the next generation to also step into some of these leadership roles and, and have an empathy and understanding of what they're managing in terms of water and agriculture and the wildlife and the ducks. Um, I didn't get into a lot of this on the investing in innovations in viable technologies, practices, policies, and business models. So a key point that I, t I left to the video to bring out, a lot of our research that we work on is, is not really hooked into the final user. So we do a lot of our, no, I'm not, just in, uh, and broadly, when we do research to think very early on about the final users and how decisions are going to get made, and one of our producers in Nebraska makes this point. He, he has a, t a, a cell phone and he has 35 apps on there. He controls about 10 pivots. And he has all that information on his cell phone. And we are producing a, another app for water management. And he said, I need this integrated into my decision making. But whether it's him with his cell phone or a small, small farmer in Rwanda, we need to understand the management system before you can really put a, 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 a a message into that so they can, it, they can, it can help them make the decision. So, so the point there is really this, including the farmers, this, with an extension service, this seems obvious, but in lots of places, and particularly in some of these technologies with agriculture, as now people are looking at where the opportunities are in agriculture, a lot of these technologies are being developed somewhere else and being applied in, in an agricultural community. And, and they haven't started the conversations with the farming community early enough to really realize they're going down a rabbit hole. And, and, and where, where, how do you make this fit with the farmer's decision-making system? And, um, I, and that's need, it needs to be fit for purpose. Again, you take one idea from Nebraska and you try and translate that into Rwanda. Or we, we, we're in discussions with parts of Brazil around this. It, it, it needs to be... It needs to be developed, the principles developed, and then the, the, those principles applied in, in, in that location, especially on these issues around the governance and institutions, um, and integration with the existing system. And the, the big issue in Africa, or a lot of the African countries we're working in, is lots of good pilot projects that work really well, and then the donor or the supporter pulls out, and the project dies. How do you get them? sustainable, and we've looked at that from the social, the organizational, and so forth. The piece that's missing there is, is the viable business models that work at the farm levels, that work in the value chains, that provide the, the, the pumps, to provide the irrigation systems, the fertilizers, and so forth, that quite often, outside the major capital city, you can't get a lot of that support. So it's really looking at the business models, and that's why we focus on that particular piece of of developing the small scale producers because they, they need, again, to integrate into their system, but also what is the other pieces they need that in Nebraska and Arkansas, the state provides in terms of roads and power and all those other things where in, in remoter parts of Africa, it's, it's, you need to think about where the electricity is going to come from and where all these other pieces are going to come from. And then just finally, if, you're, if this is uh, what you're interested in or if you've got more questions, after three years, we'll have our first global, in-person global conference. We bring people from around the world, from other states, and we'd certainly like to have people come from the, uh, Arkansas. Um, it's early in May. It's going to be online, live streamed, and will be also be recorded on YouTube. So uh, there's a number of sessions. Unfortunately, I had a colleague here approach me, and their session proposal didn't get accepted. And so I, <laughs> I need to go back and look at that one. but. Uh, uh, it, it's, there's a wide variety of things from the institutions to the water quality to surprisingly three sessions on small scale irrigation in, in Africa with the World Bank and USAID and other partners being there. So certainly you'd be more than welcome to come and enjoy the hospitality of Nebraska, which I hope would reach the same standards as Arkansas because it's certainly been a fabulous three days here. Thank you.
are going to open it up to a few questions. We got about 15 minutes for that. We'll have a couple members of our team on each side with a microphone to hand out. You'll just raise your hand kind of like we did before and then we'll have someone come over to you i think we may have someone who already has a question wants to start dr henry raise your hand not yet okay <laughs> right. i heard you had a question anyone else have a question you want to be the first to start okay i'm coming Hello. Uh, my name is Alon Sutton. I'm a retired teacher, been connected to water a million different ways, environmental sciences. Um, my question is, what do you see protecting water on the global scale? In any way. <laughs> um, sorry, I forgot I had the mics on. Um, that's a, a very good question, uh, because we've got international water, I don't think it's actually law, but agreements. We've got a lot of um, uh, things in place, but water tends to be, water tends to be the victim of a lot of the political falling outs and, and, and challenges. So it's, uh, I, in Eritrea, I worked on a tributary of the Nile, and I, I've, I spent quite a lot of time in Ethiopia, I know, this, there's a big dam being built in Ethiopia now that actually, uh, very interestingly, was first conceived by the American US GS in 1960, in the early 1960s as part of the kind of Cold War efforts in, 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 in Ethiopia. That dam's being built. For years, the Ethiopians could never raise the money. Now they've raised the money. There's been all kinds of efforts by the World Bank for the Nile Basin Initiative and others to really get the countries to understand this was coming, to how this could be managed. But uh, Ethiopia was never given, never was able to get anything of that kind of nature going. And then they started building it. They got the money themselves. Uh, 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 they've now reached enough capacity where they can get that. They're going ahead with this. And this is really in itself is creating all kinds of issues in the region. It's further contributing to some of the instability issues there. And, and, and all the work that's been done to plan for that, the agreements that are in place, when you the international agreements basically say everyone's entitled to fair use. Well, when Egypt has been using this for 100 years, they've had the high Aswan Dam for 80 years, they basically see it as two countries on the Nile, and there's actually 13 countries on the Nile. And all these other countries have, for one reason or another, haven't been able to develop the water resource. Yeah, fair use, it's, uh, but then Egypt is completely dependent on the Nile, and, 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 and therefore it's, it's a f massive national security. So when the politics stoke that up to the point that it's stoked up in that region now, it's very difficult to walk that back. So unfortunately, uh, water resources, I think there's a lot going on. The large NGOs engaging in major ecosystems around the world. There's a lot of efforts with, uh, uh, down at community levels with engaging the kids in managing the resources. In Indonesia, you see communities managing the resource. That river system that feeds into Jakarta, that's been highly polluted. But they've been working on, on, on trying to reverse that. But it's, you know, it's reversing. But again, one thing I see with this small scale irrigation is actually to make, to twin that with the, the community management of the water resource. Because you can never get the state level or the national level to manage at that level. So getting the communities to manage it and give them, but they can't manage it if they don't have a, a revenue stream. They need money, they need a, an income. And that's why it is, it needs to, water ends up being an opportunity for the communities to grow their, their wealth, as a, not, basically have some assets, and then also manage the water resources, recognizing that. So that's a big lift, but it's, it's, it's certainly, uh, it, for me, the hope is in the communities uh, and, and, and recognizing that and supporting that. But these large interbasin things are very tricky because the politics change, change everything. We have a question here in the back. Very much enjoyed your presentation, but I have a question. What, what do you think uh, uh, the competition for water is going to be and how agriculture will fare in that future? And I'll give you an example. If you look at what's going on in South Carolina right now, uh, Google has relocated a lot of their
there uh, are, are certainly plants there that, uh, because they want the cold groundwater to use as a, as a way to cool their servers. But yeah, it's causing problems for agriculture because Google has moved in to become a large groundwater user uh, for a different, something completely different from agriculture. Uh, as the West considers, I mean, continues out West, do you see Arkansas being a target of, of others wanting to, to come in and, 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 and make use of our water? Yes, very much so. And, and, and in South Carolina, the, uh, that, where Hilton Head is and, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, in, in Georgia, uh, Savannah. Savannah, sorry. Savannah, that, there's a huge groundwater uh, uh, deficit underneath those two towns. They're not very big, and, and, it, it's, and, and the agriculture around there is not very intense, but the, the groundwater, uh, managing the groundwater in South Carolina, again, the institutions and, and the capacity to manage that is, is problematic, and, and something like, uh, I, I don't know to what extent, where, I'm not sure where Google is located there, but certainly that's, that's a, a, an important it's an important thing to look at. It's then what are the volumes involved? Because quite often, this is a thing that in India gets confusing. Quite often, a, a major factory moves in, and, and how do they protect the water resource? And it gets uh, the communities get are very highly mobilized. But actually, the water use by agriculture is so much greater than than, than uh, the, these other uses. But again, a large user like Google for the cooling. But then it's not a consumptive use. So technically, they could use that water. So again, there's, there's opportunities there for a win-win if, if, if the state is engaging in that. But that's where the leadership in the state needs to be involved. Uh, across the world? Um, unfortunately, the good stories are limited. Uh, and you, again, you have to look under the sort of, you have to, the Ogallala, um, it's uh, the cha part of the issue in Kansas, uh, well, the, the main issue, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, they don't have the sand hills. And, and, and that's, that's, those sand hills aren't connected to those parts of the aquifer. So, so the water available to them is much less. And, and so that groundwater, is, it's pumping down faster and they're recovering it is, is challenging. It's destabilizing communities because they, they simply uh, don't have enough, uh, that, that water has been part of the economic, part of, the, part of uh, uh, sustaining that water resource. Then in places like India, a big part in India what it was, during the Green Revolution, water was seen as key they, they moved into Punjab, uh, Gujarat, so western, northwestern India. They, they provided electricity to the farms with the tube wells. It's kind of at the same time as Nebraska was, was developing all this, probably the same time that, that Arkansas was developing this. But they provided subsidized electricity. Some states like Punjab provided free electricity. Free electricity meant there was no cost to power to, to pump more and keep going down. And it was just a race to the bottom because the, so, so energy has a bit of a, uh, so you go to Eastern India into, the, into Bahi, Bihar and, and the Gan, uh, uh, West Bengal near Bangladesh. There they have their equivalent of the sand hills coming from the Ganges River that recharges it. But at the same time, they also don't have the electricity. So it's been diesel, other energy sources. And there they have the water resources and that's been managed. So there are positive stories, but it's where there tends to be recharge and there tends to not be access to free, po free power. Free power has been, a, and that, there was the political will to provide the free power. There wasn't the political will to switch it off or, or start managing it back. So it takes leadership to really address some of those issues. So it's, and, and when you've got a large farming community as your voter base, 
it's it's a very difficult thing to reverse. So it and that's not only that's caused problems in the energy sectors because the government didn't finance the energy companies to provide the fee electricity. So that's compounded the situation. Long-winded answer to a simple question. But, yeah. Yes, uh, I, I'm not that familiar with it. I've been around it in, in various ways. Certainly in Oklahoma, the, the, the USGS, it was certainly were creating the issues with the round uh, earthquakes, uh, and, and that's been an issue. I, you know, then that, and we then have European countries which have completely banned fracking, um, including my, my home country. That decision was at the, the devolved government level. I think that was a mistake. Uh, to be honest, I think, admit, but again, this Ukraine war has made people rethink that piece because the natural gas component to this is, uh, euphemistically we'll call it a transition fuel, but certainly it's made, sent a message that we cannot, we're not ready to transfer completely over to green energy at the moment. That, that Scotland has done a lot on getting to green energy, but they, we, they were still good. It's, it's not going to happen tomorrow, and, and if we have an emergency like we've just had, that's going to be a problem. So I think there's, there's always trade-offs in water. And, and, and it, we only have the information that's in front of us to make decisions around that. But again, do you make a you, you making the right decision, but then you have to think about, you might have to reverse that going forward. Like, like with dams. We are taking dams down in this country, but likely we're going to be rethinking dams in California now. So it, it's, it's a pendulum. And, and it, it, that though the environment we make a decision in will change again in the future. And, and so the planning for that is really difficult. So we have to have bright people there in the middle of those decisions to make good decisions. Hi, Peter. It's Henry. Thanks again for your presentation. I think everyone in the room really appreciates the perspective, the global perspective, of how we've been in water management in, in the world. So thank you very much for that. My question is this, it's simple. If you were to give Arkansas, if you could, I'm asking you to, <laughs> one goal to shoot for, one thing that agriculture should try to shoot for in the next 10 years, something we should try to accomplish that would set us up for success globally, what would that be? One thing. <laughs> one thing that we should shoot for. Um. Um, brother, that's going to be challenging. I, if I, I do, I, I, I think it's it's investing in people. It's it's investing in, in that si side of it. But it's it's around really uh, what you're doing, the work you're doing, what we're seeing with the localized man. Again, coming back to the communities, the, the farmers are the ultimate stewards of the land in these contexts. So they have to be. They have to be part of the solution. This is part of the issue. I engage at this global level in these big events. Is I get there, and the last time they ask farmers after they've made all the decisions, and, and it's sort of they have to be at the table. Now, no matter how hard the discussion is, they have to be at the table. So I do think those awkward discussions need to, need to be had and, 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 and sorted through, and, and the ultimate solutions will not be to anyone's satisfaction in terms of the, what comes out of that. But I, I, it is that management at the local level, taking some of the things we saw that the farmers are already doing, because that's a, an issue we have with the water quality is, the good farmers already know what to do and, and are usually doing it if, it if they can do it within their economic constraints and, and, and labor constraints. It's, it's then getting the other you know, X percent to, to really take on those things. So in a five, 10 year time frame, scaling that up, and, and, and getting that to, to really uh, get a, a, a better understanding of how to manage the water on that landscape scale, sort of one farm at a time, uh, because each farm's unique, and, 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 and managing that. But at the same time, as, as what I was trying to say with the Platte River is, you have to think at the basin scale. You have to, so you have to think at the basin scale, and that's not the farmers are doing that, it's, it's the others in the room that need to think at that but think about what then that means. So and on that landscape across the delta, the groundwater, how quickly are we going to get water out there to those farmers with these large scale irrigation systems? 
but it is really getting those farmers to, to, to change, to, to conserve water, as I was hearing that was the term being used. Uh, um, and and uh, investments there, but use that as a way to train the next generation. And, and some of it is not necessarily extension, it's not necessarily government, it's actually how do you catalyze the young people to be entrepreneurs. The young gentleman from Rwanda, this idea of them getting excited about agriculture and water management. Uh, this is a term as uh, the president of the African Development Bank says, making agriculture cool. And, and, and I think that's very important. It's a farmer-centric approach to managing those landscapes. Realizing also that there's some decisions made on farms that, that aren't, need to be managed off the farms as well. Tough question, Chris. Sorry that I... <laughs> Thank you, Peter, Thank you, so much. Will you please join me in, in thanking uh, Dr. Peter? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One thing I hope that you realize that I learned very quickly when I started talking to Dr. McCormick is, um, you know, you said to me the first day that we spoke on the phone, this is a global issue with local solutions, and I am not going to be prescriptive, but you did bring your expertise, and you were so thoughtful in your time with us and asking questions and getting to know so many people in the room. So it's been such a joy and a pleasure to work with you. So thank you so much for visiting Arkansas. Yeah. Thank you very it. much, everybody. you with a couple of different things here um, as we go into the lunch hour. We, we invite all of you to stay and continue to talk with one another and network and talk with Dr. McCormick and his wife Miriam if you haven't met her, uh, please do. And we want to continue these conversations. I think we heard a lot of good ideas, good recommendations today. What is very clear is that water is such a complex issue. And there are, there's more than one solution to the problem. More than that, there are just so many opportunities. So how do we those? And that's what the Institute is going to be looking at over the next several months and, and the next year. Um, we are putting up a survey that we would like for you to answer for us. If you have your phone and you want to pull it out and bring up your camera app, you can scan this QR code and it'll bring you to a survey and we want your expertise part of what we do here we bring people to the institute is learn what you're curious about and how we can help you collaborate so as you pull this up if you want to leave us there's some questions on there about the future of water management in arkansas and how we can capitalize on opportunities moving forward as we work together so i'm going to invite you to do that um, for those of you who don't maybe want to use the qr code there are surveys out in the Flagstone foyer, and so please pick up one and leave it with us before you go. Um, Molly, did I miss anything? Okay, we are going to have lunch uh, in just a few minutes, but I do want to uh, close with just a little bit, as I as I always like to do, anchoring in with the Rockefeller's legacy. Um, Governor Rockefeller moved here 70 years ago last month, and when he moved to the mountain, he wanted to build a cattle farm. Most of you know this story. Uh, and he was told by the people who lived in the area that it would be so much easier to build that cattle farm down in the valley instead of on top of the mountain. One of the reasons that it was difficult to build a cattle farm on the mountain was because there was no water. Well, there was water, but not an abundant supply of water to feed the pasture land and to take care of the cattle. And so with Rockefeller, one of his, you know, I think key leadership characteristics is his resolve and his determination and his willingness to be innovative and see the possibilities. And so he said, I want the cattle farm on the mountain. So he pumped the water 800 feet up from the Arkansas River to this farm. And I tell that story just to say that, you know, that kind of innovation and that kind of determination and um, curiosity is what is going to fuel us in the future. And the reason that I know that that's true is because I spent two days in Stuttgart, Arkansas, uh, just less than 24 hours ago, talking to a couple of farmers who are standing in their rice fields. Uh, one, uh, Stephen Hoskins, I remember, you know, I was just, just listening to him talk about how he is experimenting with row rice 
Um, and so, you know, that's a much more water efficient way to grow rice, and yet there are issues. You know, he's going to lose about 10% of his yield in some cases. Um, he's having to figure out how to do these very, very scientific and micro adjustments to the, the kind of rice he plants, how he deals with pests, how he deals with weeds. And he's standing there talking to us, and you can see him wrestling with all of this in his head. And he's thinking about it, and he's trying to make it work because, A, he knows it's more efficient for him as a farmer. And farmers don't work as volunteers, do they, Wes? They need to make a profit. He knows it's more efficient, but he also knows that it's right, not just for him, but for his community, for the collective, for all of us. And so, you know, we also went to the Dabs farm, and we heard about the story of Terry and Trent Dabs, and, you know, they, they, they were um, sort of motivated to make these changes on their discovery farm to learn how to be more efficient users of water and how to reduce, in fact, basically get away from using groundwater. They were forced to think about that because of the groundwater depletion in their area, but that has not stopped their innovation. They continue to think about cool ways that they can, you know, still uh, control the water management and improve efficiency on their farm. And so you see Trent with his phone controlling everything, you know, from his app. And that kind of spirit of determination and innovation that went to Rockefeller brought to Arkansas as a cattle farmer, it's the same thing that Arkansans are doing today. So I hope that those stories um, get replicated, and I hope the innovation and the technology gets replicated. And the way in which we can help all of us in this room and the Institute be a part of that is very, very exciting for the future. So thank you all so much for the gift of your time and your attention. I hope you'll continue to have this conversation, continue to reach out to us. Please don't forget about the survey. And have a wonderful, wonderful spring break and Friday afternoon. Thank you very much for coming.